Hi friends. Welcome to the YouTube channel Read Stories Every Day. That time an American was reincarnated into another world by SP4DE. Chapter 71, Lalo. Umara closed her mouth and utilized her internal monologue. John? What is this? I don't know. I'm just using my aura. You're reading my thoughts. Something like that. We stared at each other. For me, it wasn't particularly difficult to do what I was doing. I had simply discovered another way to use aura, and it came as if completely natural. But Umara looked like she was struggling to control her thoughts and refrain from speaking aloud to communicate. I could clearly feel her nervousness grow as well. She obviously wasn't used to worrying about controlling her thoughts in case someone read them. I could even feel a bit of resistance from the small amount of psycho within her, not enough to do anything to me, but enough to let me know that she wasn't very comfortable with me inside her mind. When I noticed this, I pulled away and retracted my aura. She took a few deep breaths once I did, composing herself with an apologetic expression. I I am sorry. It's not like I don't trust you. I know. It's fine. I still need to practice too. I smiled at her. Inserting myself into her mind and reading her thoughts was a whole other level of intrusion, or intimacy depending on how you looked at it. I would say it surpassed sex, even marriage, in that regard. After all, no matter what, everyone always had their own thoughts, their own mind that they could seclude themselves into, a place that was theirs and theirs alone. I had suddenly taken that away from her. If she had done that to me, I would be a bit nervous too. Well, it wasn't like she couldn't feel it happening. As for whether she could forcefully stop it, I wasn't sure. We would have to see after practicing some more. Section 8 Dismissed Oh, perfect timing. I grabbed Umara and stood with her, packing my chair. I need to get one of those. Umara mumbled, her eyes on the chair as it disappeared. I chuckled while putting my gun away, walking with her off the wall. I had a bit of a headache from all the shooting, but it was overshadowed by the discovery of my new ability. It felt like my aura became more tangible, more like a limb instead of some fleeting feeling. When I reached out to Umara, it was almost like pushing a cloud of my aura toward her and then connecting to her mind by transmitting electrical signals across that cloud, like lightning. It was definitely odd, but that was simply the way I visualized what was happening. And if I failed to visualize it, the aura became much more difficult to control. Interestingly enough though, controlling my aura didn't take energy, only concentration. While concentrating took energy in its own way, it still meant that I wasn't expending psyche to do something you'd think would cost quite a large amount of it. Or maybe I just wasn't trying hard enough. Either way, basic telepathy seemed both easy and difficult to carry out. Despite it happening rather seamlessly, it was a challenge to actually read Umara's thoughts, specifically what she was trying to say. Her mind felt like a mess of quiet chitterings, and only when she utilized her internal monologue did I finally hear something I could pick up on like a voice piercing through a thick veil of static over a radio. It was up to me to get better at tuning in, but it would take practice to figure out how. Still, I couldn't help but think of the possibilities. What if instead of a voice, we could pass on visuals? Would I be able to directly give her my memories of science? Would she be able to understand it directly? It was another level of communication surpassing anything else in this world and even on Earth. I was eager to use it. Umara and I left both of us tired from several hours of fighting. Thankfully, everyone's efforts managed to drive off the tide. There was no need to worry about it anymore. We went and found some of the rations, eating them while hanging around our platoon's supply cache. Since we were visitors at this outpost, there weren't any proper bunks to house us. We would need to set up camp within a dedicated field for the night since we definitely weren't going back to base today. Hey! Umara tapped me, drawing my gaze. That thing you did. How? I just used my aura to reach out into your mind. I had been thinking and it occurred to me somehow. I went on to explain what went through my head. How aura was like an extension of magical powers rather than a separate entity. I told her to think of it like it was a limb, a medium to extend her powers through. She could already use her aura to cast spells beyond her body, using the space around her instead of her palm which enabled her to cast several at once. I told her to use that feeling. But finding a way to use Aura wasn't so simple. After all, what else was she supposed to do with it besides what she was already doing? Finding an application for it was harder than using it. And I couldn't really help her with that. I didn't know how to use Mana. It would be up to her for inspiration, 
and all I could really do was give her ideas about Aura itself. She sighed after a while, realizing nothing would just come to her like it had for me. I'll have to work on it. We should also try practicing whatever it is that you did. Telepathy. Telepathy. Yet. Yeah. That's what speaking between minds is called, a nonverbal method of sending information directly to another person. I see. Then we should practice your telepathy. It should be very valuable in combat. MM. So long as you are comfortable with it. She nodded as I glanced in the distance, seeing the rest of our squad walking over. Their armor was covered in blood and grime. It seems they had been busy. I will admit that I was quite nervous suddenly feeling your aura within my mind and knowing you could read my thoughts, but there's no reason I shouldn't try to work with it. And if I really were against it, then I should learn how to counter it anyway. I admire your commitment to becoming better. Still, I'll know when you're not up for it. I'll be in your mind, after all. So long as you don't disregard my determination. M.M. I smiled at her. Then, the others arrived. I looked at their bloodied selves and chuckled. Put you to work, hey. Something like this is normal for us. What's not normal is how easy you make missions when you're watching over us. I don't miss defensive formations. Tana grumbled while stripping her armor, revealing her thin clothing that stuck to her toned body slick with sweat. Faden and Vetsmon were the same. All three of them looked tired. It was just that their tired looked different from mine or Umara's tired. Like many others in our platoon, we decided to set up camp on the dedicated field. I pulled out several items for that purpose and finally experienced my first campout in another world. All squads were given a single tent large enough for six people. It wasn't very luxurious, just large, and the fabric thick enough to protect against the elements. Everyone was required to sleep under the same tent for safety reasons. Being separated was just asking to be picked off. Gender separation was also non-existent. There was no cooking equipment and only a few large wool blankets. Other than some basic necessities and the rations, this was all we had. Though it was technically all we needed, living like this for any longer than a week would be rather horrid. However, Dumara brought out something that would make longer-term campouts far more bearable. I have this water tap if anyone needs it. She held up a white crystal surrounded by a metal encasing engraved with complex spell runes. It was capable of generating water like a hose. How convenient. A warlock capable of water spells alone would be able to sustain an entire team by themselves for weeks so long as they could find a bit of food. The most valuable resource in the world produced with the wave of a hand. Vetsmon thanked Umara and took the crystal, using it to wash his armor. Tana and Faden used it after him. I made final preparations as the sun started to set, painting the sky a pleasant orange and purple. John. As I started to relax while admiring the sky, I was called. I came back down to earth and glanced over at the puppet master, who was shockingly here. Do you mind heading up the walls and helping with the remnants? I stared at him in silence for several seconds before rising from my seat and walking over. The others watched me go without a word. I ascended the wall, communing with my gun, setting up my chair, and getting settled. At least there wasn't much more daylight. I wouldn't have to do this for more than an hour or so. Boom. I took my shot, sending echoes across the landscape and startling the entire base. The beast at the end of my sights fell unceremoniously. Then, I felt a presence approaching me. It was the puppet master. He leaned against the wall beside me, his arms crossed and his gaze overlooking everything beyond the walls. I took one more shot before letting him speak. There are a lot of unhappy individuals, and rumors are being spread. Uh-huh. I'm not a fan of Carrion either. He's been in his position for decades and has quite an impressive ego, not something that can be lightly challenged by a new student who bent the rules to get in. You're under Alberon's tutelage so I'm not completely worried, but I know you and think some things are better laid out clearly. Bang. Another shot, and another beast collapsed. For a 200-yard shot with iron sights, it was pretty good. My gaze remained within the confines of my sights. You're walking on thin ice, kid. I had wanted to talk to you earlier but Carrion kept a close eye on me. A lot of people now want you dead, though they still think you're nothing more than a nuisance who tried to slander their name, a commoner who doesn't know how deep this shit goes. And I suggest you keep it that way. I know you're not naive, so use theirs. And so long as you don't go out of your way to cause trouble, I'll do what I can to make sure they don't force your hand. Boom. I took one more shot and lifted my rifle, 
pulling away from the wall and glancing at the puppet master. I couldn't hide the smile. I appreciate it, Mr. Puppet. Really? So long as you're aware. I'll be damned if I allow you to let this get to your head, but the truth remains that you're incredibly talented. You're easily the most powerful summoner who has ever stepped foot into the magisterium. If you were a noble, you'd have your path paved with gold and marrying someone like Umara would come with but a word. But you're a commoner, with a head harder than knights yet as intelligent as a summoner should be. So please, don't waste the gifts you've been given. At the very least, wait until you no longer need to. M.M. I'll do as you say. Wise. And so long as you're underneath my wing, I'll make sure the rest of the children stay obedient. We just have to get you to the military and the issues of nobility will disappear rather quickly. It'll be no more than seven months from now. Can you last seven months? I'll give you my best. I smirked, thinking about how funny this whole situation was. The puppet master grumbled after that. In all my years I've never lost an elite. I will not have the first die by your hand just because he didn't realize he was staring down the barrel of death. Nor will I let your talent be squandered, even if simply for the good of humanity. Hmm. I doubted I was good enough to affect humanity as a whole. Perhaps Maxwell's advancement path would change the dynamic of the summoner class, but I was still merely the trial run for that. But the thought was nice. It was comforting to know that I had the puppet master to look out for me, a sail to guide me through the rocky waters, diverting the animosity of loathsome noble children. I owed it to him and Umara to try and lay low. Maybe I would have to swallow my pride, but with his reminder on top of Maxwell's, I was becoming more understanding of the fact that these nobles really would end me for even small things. Damn this world and its insane power gaps. What happened to guns being the great equalizer? So much for my ideas of world domination. End NBSP. End Chapter 71, Lay Low. That time an American was reincarnated into another world by SP4DE. Chapter 72, Expect the Worst. Two days passed at the outpost, the commanders keeping us there just in case there was another follow-up attack. And there was, but it was hardly a threat. A few thousand monsters that were wiped out in half a day. After that, the other magisterium squad was sent out with a dozen other soldiers to go hunt the commanding entity. Once they came back with its head, we were allowed to go back to base. The day after we did so, packing what little supplies we had left and making the drive back. The next couple days after that were uneventful. All the other squads, elite and regular alike, were sent out on constant missions. Many of them were hunting missions, some of them were reinforcement missions to other outposts. We were allowed to recuperate before getting sent out on regular patrols. Unlike at Colatro base, each patrol had three vehicles of soldiers. If we were ever ambushed, we would always have a fighting chance unless some freakish enemy suddenly appeared. And during all the downtime we had, I simply worked on what I needed to. Whether that was practicing my shooting, working on my advancement formation, or training my telepathy. Umara was very receptive to my telepathy, willing to train it with me. And at first she had some issues with it. I could tell that she got anxious with the level of interconnectedness and I decided to break the connection a few times. After all, I was reading her thoughts, and to a certain extent, she couldn't stop me. Her own aura wasn't strong enough to directly counter mine and she didn't have enough psycho within her mind to block me out forcefully. She had to learn how to compartmentalize her thoughts, how to hide certain things by simply refusing to acknowledge a thought. There were a lot of mind games to play and, thankfully, I was able to guide her through a lot of it. After all, with my psyche and spark, my mind was freakishly amazing. It simply wasn't the mind of a human anymore. With faster speed of thought and a better memory, the sheer amount of information going through my head at any given time was several times higher than before. And I had discovered a lot about myself over time especially about how to micromanage my mind. I pulled on these experiences and helped Umara. Because to some extent, learning how to counter mind reading would be valuable. There were all kinds of magic in this world, like the lie detector spell Duchess Tolaria used on me. If the day came where someone tried to use one on us, then it would be valuable to know how to prevent it from gaining anything. Because unless it directly extracted memories or information, those spells could attain nothing but the subjective opinion we gave it. It was the difference between reality and someone's own truth. They weren't always the same. But it was clear that Umara would need some time to get there, because she definitely wasn't right now. There were some thoughts that leaked, ones that I was able to pick up on and ones that embarrassed her greatly. Some of it was rather radical, 
and a lot of it was sexual. I ignored it, pretending that I couldn't read all her thoughts clearly even though my ability grew by the day. It eased her mind, but there were times that she slipped up and I had to cut the connection to give her space to collect herself. I learned a lot about her over the course of just a few days. To put it lightly, I had no need whatsoever to doubt the integrity of our relationship. If anything, she made it seem like I was going too slow but both of us knew that we couldn't move forward so recklessly. I might be able to read some of her thoughts in the moment, but her impressions and subconscious leanings were still a mystery. That would take time to solidify and bring forward, and doing something extreme just because of a fleeting thought could flip those same thoughts very quickly. I had to learn to navigate the intricacies of the mind if I were to try and use my powers of the mind better. Practicing with Umara taught me far more than just how to tune into her thoughts better. It gave me access to the mind of another person, a source of profound insights into the nature of the human psyche. The notion to let Vetsman and Faden in on this crossed my mind as well, but for now I decided to keep it private. Not because I didn't trust them, but simply because keeping this a secret power between Umara and I made our relationship feel more special, which she liked. Once I got much better at it, I could use it in a more practical way with the others. For now, it remained an intimate bond with my girlfriend. Not that it also wasn't practical. My aura was honed massively in the short time since I discovered telepathy. Whereas before I could sense the emotions of others, I could now sense them with far greater detail. It was the difference between sensing anger and knowing who or what it was directed toward. It was a step below directly reading thoughts with a cursory glance. Not only that, but I could sense how the mind connected with the rest of someone's body. I had tuned into this feeling while watching Vetsman and Faden spar one day. I knew where they would move around a second before they actually did. However, because they moved so quickly in the mere span of a single second, I sensed the entire backlog of actions within that second. And the only reason it was only a second was because of the amount of movements. Things changed dynamically, and an action Faden was planning to make two seconds ago could change. If anything, a single second of prediction was the best case and might only apply to the things they wanted to do, and that could change depending on the actions of their opponent. Reliably, it was only about half a second in advance where their movements would almost always fall according to my predictions because changing their actions within that tiny span was incredibly difficult if they were already committed. Not only that, but when I tried to predict the movements of them both, although things became far more complex, I was able to understand them better and increase the accuracy of my predictions. Naturally, this led to me understanding certain things about how knights fought and the differences between their combat styles and techniques. How they held their spears, the way Vetsman shifted his weight around his shield, the way Faden directed his momentum between the ground and the tip of his spear, and how their center of gravity shifted constantly. It was a lot to take in and I could only begin to do something so crazy because of the power of my mind. But it was clear that it was still beyond me to some extent. I couldn't see the flow of battle and wouldn't be able to predict who won. It would take more observation over months in order to get a grasp, and that was only on those two. For another person, I would have to start from scratch. It was a good thing that my memory was getting better. I couldn't imagine trying to work with such a fast mind if I just forgot everything the next second. As for how this worked with beasts, I wasn't entirely sure. I would need time out in the field to get some data. At least for people though, it worked pretty well. What was especially great was how I could sense all the gazes around me, and sense whenever someone directed hostility at me. Whether it was silent judgment or outright hatred, I could sense it all, and it came rather frequently. I could now easily tell who it came from, and it was always a noble, elite, or otherwise. Or maybe one of their goons, of which there were many. But I could tell that they were always too tired to do anything. It was clear that the puppet master was working them pretty hard, constantly sending them on missions and keeping them off my back. Couldn't be mad if you didn't have the energy to. Every since our conversation that day, I hadn't had a single altercation. I kept to myself and my squad simply doing as I was asked and refraining from being social. Still, I couldn't help but feel that something was brewing in the background. So in order to try and hone in on that feeling, I had to change my thought process and look at things differently. To the rest of the noble class, Domara was an extremely valuable asset to acquire. She was the daughter of Duchess Talaria who herself had access to one of the largest markets in the kingdom. Her city was an economic power in and of itself, and as its leader, she wielded massive amounts of money and influence. Marrying her daughter was like snatching a golden ticket. You would gain access to not just the Duchess, but to her markets and her connections. Unless you had nothing, 
you would gain immeasurably. Even other dukes would feel the prosperity. If it were anyone else below that level, they would be elevated to a whole new level. Even a royal child would gain access to a huge sponsor. And here I was, taking Umara for myself. And I wasn't even in the position to gain much of anything from her. Sure, she had money to spend, but even if I were willing to take advantage of that, the monetary gains couldn't come close to the financial gains of an entire business being given wings by the deep connections her mother held in the palm of her hand. So Umara was being completely wasted on someone like me. In the eyes of nobles, there was very little reason not to get rid of me. They simply had too much to gain. The only reason they weren't killing me outright was likely because of optics. It was clear that Umara liked me a lot, so getting on her bad side would only ruin the chances of other suitors. If I had to guess, they were waiting for our little fling to fade out. Once Umara was no longer interested in messing around with her boy toy, they could kill me without consequence. That would take time. How much time, though, was the big question. The puppet master stated that as soon as I entered the military, my issues with nobility would dissipate. I could only assume that touching the soldiers of the kingdom's military was taboo. So they would have to find other means besides assassinating me, but that would also make it far more difficult for me to die so easily. So then they had seven months until the time I left the magisterium. Would they kill me within that time? If Omara never looked like she was losing interest in me, then there would still be consequences for killing me. But that still didn't outweigh the benefits. Sooner or later she would get over my death and they would have their way. So at what point would they become desperate? And by then, what measures would they take to kill me? Perhaps they would have one of their children do it. Just maybe, that swordsman, Pontac Gulliard, was my biggest threat. As the strongest elite, son of a duke, and one of Omara's suitors, he had every reason to kill me and enough backing to get away with it. So either I had to be extra wary of his blade, or he would find someone else to kill me and take the fall so he could swoop in later on. There were seven months left for everyone to get stronger. Maxwell believed I could hit authority five before then. And maybe I would have to, for my own sake. For now, I didn't believe there was any reason to be concerned about those around me. It was still too early. They wanted Umara, or more specifically wanted me gone, but doing anything right now would cost them more than if they just waited. They probably didn't believe Omara was actually serious about me. I was nothing more than a commoner leeching off of her wealth, a parasite trying to bite off more than I could chew. I was scum in their eyes, that much was clear. I had a pretty good grasp on how the topmost echelons lived their lives and viewed those underneath them. Duchess Talaria was an exception to that. She was turning out to be very wise and open-minded, raising a daughter with good taste and a smart head on her shoulders. But the others weren't like that. I couldn't assume the best until they proved it. So every noble was to be treated as if they looked down on everything and everyone below them. I had to expect the worst. But they also weren't stupid. They had mind-boggling power but they knew when and how to use it. If I wanted to keep myself safe, I needed to accumulate as much as I could, lay low for as long as possible, but keep an eye on everyone around me. Through the malice of nobles I would be able to gauge when they were reaching their limit. What I would do when the bell tolled would be decided at that time. And NBSP. End Chapter 72, Expect the Worst. That time an American was reincarnated into another world by SP4DE. Chapter 73, Run. I haven't asked in a while. Hum. Duchess Talaria, looked at her husband, curious about his sudden question in bed. Tonight, having finished his work early, he was able to have dinner with the family and go to bed at a reasonable hour. She had been reading a book, but his interruption made her shut it. Umara's boyfriend. You know more about him than I do. You only said that he's at least genuine. I intend to meet him soon but until then I'd like to know if there has been any news about him. Oh. Well, there was one interesting happening a few weeks ago at the ball. The Duchess went on and described the events surrounding John's suspension. She talked all about John's altercation with the noble children and then his verbal battle with the President. Ikor's eyes widened with every word. He did what? You heard me. It was lucky that he didn't do anything beyond throwing insults. Umara told me later that he could have killed that boy easily if he wanted to. You believe that? That kid is a knight and as far as I know, rather talented. I do. I guess I haven't shown you his record yet, hmm. The Duchess raised her aerial, tapping it a few times before sending a message. Ikor opened his own to see the Black Spider repository specifically the bounty on John's head. 
below it was also an investigation report containing all the information the Duchess was able to find on him. His eyes bulged even more, reading what seemed to be a small biography of the kid. A kill count in the triple digits? He's a killer. Don't be so dramatic. He was basically forced and none of the people he killed were innocent. Most are from the trenches. You forget about the human conflicts, distracted by the scourge. At the very least I can tell you he's not a bad person. You seem to stick up for him. Considering he's a commoner, the very act of letting him date our daughter is beyond gracious. I know, which is why I did nothing to protect him from the president's ire. I let both of them take the pressure. If they can't handle it, they have no right being together. Well, it seems he handles himself just fine. Ick horse murked, scrolling through the bounty a bit more before closing it, having seen everything he needed to. He thought in silence for a while, his wife remaining silent beside him as he formulated his thoughts on the matter. The smirk never left his face. What a balls a kid. Not bad. If he can face the president, he's got enough guts to date our daughter. You approve? The Duchess' eyebrows raised in curiosity, causing her husband to scoff. Talexia, neither of us like the state of the noble class as it is right now. As far as I'm concerned, this kid is a breath of fresh air. I'll leave my first impressions for when I meet him, but for now he seems like quite the candidate. Although I have my misgivings about that awfully high kill count, I'm not naive. So long as he doesn't drag our daughter into his business, I have no issues. M.M. I've already taken care of that. As I figured. Make sure to invite him over for Christmas. Invite his family too. He doesn't have a family. No. Ikor was shocked once again, feeling great sympathy. How pitiful. My condolences to this poor child. What happened? I'm not sure. There are no records of his family ever existing. I've never found a record of his own birth either. It's like he appeared out of thin air. And from Omara's vague words about how he'll never see them again, I can only assume they died. Or maybe he came from an outlander settlement. That's a bit of a stretch. If he did, how would he come so far by himself? And why would he leave his family all alone in the first place to make such a treacherous journey? I have no idea. Either way, he's shrouded in mysteries. Hmm. Well, I don't see any major issue with it. Just invite him when they come back. Since he doesn't have a family, he can spend the holiday with us. Ikor waved and shifted into bed, obviously desiring sleep. The Duchess went under the sheets with him, but still asked a question. Are you sure that's okay? He's Umara's boyfriend. Spending the holiday here as if he were family may be more than the relationship warrants. Some might think that we endorse his candidacy. Have some sympathy, dear. Can we not set aside petty politics for three days? Since when did you become so concerned about the greed and judgments of others? Don't accuse me like that. She sighed and relaxed into her pillow. But you have a point. I'll have Umara give him the invitation. M.M. Ikor grunted closing his eyes and falling into a snooze within mere seconds. The Duchess chuckled, admiring her husband for a while before cuddling against his body and going to sleep with his warmth. I wonder what this hunting mission is about. Who knows? But we only have four days left, so let's not end this with injuries like last time, okay? Umara tilted back her head and looked up at me. The cramped bed meant she had to lay against my chest, her body between my legs with little room to move. I sat against the wall at the head of the bed, looking down at her serious face with a smile. I'll be fine. This time I'm completely covered. Even if we encountered that gorilla again I would be able to kill it by myself. I believe it. But it's not always the strong ones we have to worry about. I know. Everything is strong against me. But I've got too many tools that help keep me safe, including the support of my squad. If I get hurt despite so much being in my favor, then either we'd be screwed regardless or I'm just that much of a dumbass. Well, I'll admit that you're at least kind of smart. Just a little. She turned and pushed herself against me, making me grin. Just a little. A teeny, tiny bit. A numerically infinitesimal amount. You and your weird words. She smiled before kissing me. We ended up staying like that for a few minutes. But then, both of us heard the door click. John. Slam. Right as Faden's voice came through, he slammed the door on himself. Umara and I glanced over. I suppose he wasn't expecting to see Umara straddling me in his own room. 
I chuckled and spoke. Come on in. Are you sure? Just come in. I rolled my eyes as he opened the door again, Umara going back to laying against me. He seemed a bit awkward looking at us. We report in ten minutes. All right. Hey, you should go get ready. M.M. Umara nodded as I pat her leg, swinging her legs over the bed. After she left and shut the door behind her, Faden mumbled. You two get closer every time I see you. I sure hope so. What about you? How's Valerie? She's good. We aren't as close as you are with Umara, but I'm trying. Eh, don't put too much pressure on yourself. If she's the one then things will work out. Don't worry about what ifs. Right. He smiled before digging through his chest, putting on some clothes and prepping his gear. I did the same. A hunt could last an entire day and I needed to prepare accordingly. Before long the two of us were walking to the briefing center. We met up with the rest of our squad along the way. And when we arrived, I saw the puppet master standing outside the door. He glanced at us. The rest of you head in. John, stick around for a second. The other looked at me before entering the room. Once the door closed behind them, the puppet master sighed. They went over my head. You're being paired up with another elite squad, and all of them are nobles. I wanted your squad to go alone with the other soldiers, but the Major General rejected my suggestions and made his specific choices. They ignored you, which never happens, I'm guessing. There have been very few instances, but yes, something like this has never happened. I'll keep my head on a swivel then. M.M. I'll trust in your rational judgment. I hummed as he left those words, walking into the room. After seating with the rest of my squad, I saw the other elites we would be fighting with. Three out of their five looked at me with disguised hostility. It was nothing I couldn't feel with my aura, so their malice was clear. My face remained neutral throughout the briefing. Our objective was to hunt a scourge scout. These scouts were beasts dedicated to getting a read on targets and handing data back to the scourge. Their appearance was usually followed by an attack or siege. We needed to kill them, which wouldn't be easy. They were slippery and usually escorted by powerful beasts. The officer gave us some images of the beasts and what we should expect. The scout was a lanky bipedal entity with one massive cyclops eye and four tiny eyes around it. It could see things at a distance and could easily detect enemies no matter where it was. Normal stealth didn't work against it. Its observational abilities were top-notch. But it had little to no offensive power. Its scarily long fingers were similar to a monkey's, allowing it to swing between trees. And when it ran, its short legs combined with the sweeping range of its arms made it surprisingly fast even on flat terrain. It was a creepy son of a bitch, but otherwise didn't pose much of a threat. Its escorts would always protect it but that was expected. Get rid of them and it was a chicken on a chopping block. However, there were varying levels of these scouts. High-level ones, while not holding greater offensive power, were much more sly, intelligent and had a few tricks up their sleeves. The different levels could be determined by the amount of little eyes around their singular large eye. Each little eye denominated its authority. The higher the authority, the stronger the escorts. And apparently, anything with strictly a single eye was to be avoided at all costs. If we saw a scout like that, running for our lives was the goal. Bang! Suddenly, the door to the briefing room was thrown open, everyone turning to the officer who came panting. Sir! We just got a report of the scout's location from Patrol 3. If we want to strike, now is the time. Good. Everyone gear up. Straight to the gates. Go. Everyone jumped from their seats, the briefing coming to a premature close. We all ran out, having already prepared, and boarded two vehicles by the gates. Both of them were APCs, enough to fit ten men each. It was also shockingly fast. After the back hatch closed with a click, the APCs sped off through the gates and into the distance. We arrive in 15 minutes. Be ready for immediate combat. The driver yelled, the truck rocking with the terrain. After settling for a few minutes, I looked across from the side of the interior where my squad sat. The other squad was directly across from us, the two sides entering something of a stare-off. I recognized three of them, elites I had previously worked with. In that squad, there were four knights and a single warlock. I was the only one of two summoners in the elites, so I couldn't be surprised when I never saw any. I didn't recognize two of them though, probably some nobles who came late to the game. Nobody said anything as we drove, but inwardly, 
I made telepathic contact with Umara. Hey! Hey! She twitched a bit when she felt my aura. By now we had gotten far more comfortable with this, so the process was close to seamless. The two of us kept looking forward though. We had decided to make it a habit of pretending as if nothing changed whenever we engaged in telepathy. It took some practice, but both of us had pretty good poker faces. This other squad. Keep an eye on them. The puppet master warned me and the situation is a bit fishy. Are they going to give you trouble? It's possible. I can already taste how much they don't like me. They're hiding it, but the malice is there. I understand. Keep your telepathy active just in case I need to warn you. All right. I smiled a bit. Umara and I had also been practicing long-term telepathy. And I had figured out a rather ingenious way to keep my telepathy active indefinitely. With my spark, I could allocate brain power toward maintaining the connection. It was difficult at first, but the spark was a second mind, so I was able to train it and make the ability run itself. Of course, it took the entire concentration of my spark since it was controlling my aura, but it wasn't a bad trade-off. I still had the rest of my mind, which was more than enough. So I handed off the telepathy to my spark, using the rest of my mind to focus on the task before us. Scout spotted. The driver suddenly shouted, the APC coming to a screeching halt. The back hatch then flew open. All the knights jumped out first, then the warlocks and myself. We assessed our surroundings. We had arrived at the top of a long hill that sloped down into a valley. The valley was filled with tall rock formations, monoliths that seemed to sprout out of the ground like trees. Each monolith was at least as tall as a four-story building and separated by an average of 150 yards. The valley was a beautiful geological formation. The monolithic rocks were covered in huge vines that seemed to grow all kinds of immature fruits, but other than the vines there wasn't anything else besides grass and the occasional flower. After taking several seconds to admire the valley, I shifted my focus to the other APC that was giving chase. The scout was making its way down our hill and into the valley among the rock formations. Around it was its escorts, about 25 spiked wolf beasts as fast as they were deadly. The other APC managed to roll down the hill and deploy its knights and warlocks, all of the soldiers rushing toward the scout but being blocked by the wolves. The scout continued to flee, its uncanny movements throwing it several yards at a time. From the hilltop, I suddenly rushed to a nearby ledge and laid down, taking out my spring field equipped with a ladder iron sight. I took a deep breath calming myself even as it continued to run further and further away. It would soon go beyond my effective range, but I didn't panic. I ticked the ladder up, increasing the zero distance before getting a steady aim. My sight trailed its figure, waiting until it reached my zero distance and estimating its average movement speed. It was lanky and erratic, the furthest thing from an easy shot. The only thing harder than this was picking off a flying bird. But the intuition of a human was a rather amazing thing. We understood the world around us inherently. It was necessary for survival. So despite needing to make several adjustments as the scout ran across varying levels of terrain, shifting up and down as it ran across the occasional boulder, I still managed to find a sweet spot. And I fired. Boom. The rifle exploded, the recoil pushing into my shoulder but my body remaining still as if it never even moved. And I watched as blood flew, the bullet tearing the scout's arm off. I smirked as Umara gawked behind me. Holy shit. That was an amazing shot. I agree. I chuckled. Umara probably understood my guns better than anyone by now. We had talked about them extensively. So she also knew how hard of a shot that was. If I was correct, the distance to the scout was about 280 yards when I fired, a bit more than the zero of 250 yards that I set for myself. But it didn't kill it. The scout, although injured and bleeding, still continued to run. But at the very least, it wouldn't get far. I wouldn't be surprised if it collapsed from blood loss eventually. Killing it would be easy once they got rid of those wolves, which would only be a matter of time. Vetsmon chuckled from behind. All right, let's go and help them. John and Umara, you can relax up here. Don't have to tell me twice. There was no way I was going to run up and down a hill if I didn't have to. Before Vetsmon ran down though, I looked to the other squad composed mostly of knights. Hey, you guys should go with them. There's no reason there should be any casualties. They were silent, a few of them looking at me with frowns. I could clearly feel their growing hatred and annoyance, like I had ruined some plan of theirs. Vetsman, Faden, and Tana also looked at them, 
expecting their cooperation. There was no reason they shouldn't, and that put even more pressure on them. But then, we all heard a shout. Board the APC. We'll drive down there. Oh. I scoffed a bit, all of us running back to the truck. Right. Why should the knights have to run as well? Why don't we all just drive down together? That's obviously the smart thing to do. It wasn't like I was trying to separate myself from a threat to my life or anything. Thanks, driver. I grumbled while boarding, the APC rolling down the hill as soon as the hatch closed. Once we arrived though, I didn't move from my seat. The knights had no choice but to embark and join the battle. The other squad looked hesitant at first, but unless they wanted to get yelled at, they would have to go. They also wouldn't attack me in front of everyone, especially my squad. So I watched them leave with even more indignation. Some even waited outside for me and Umara, but we just stayed put. I waved at them as they left. This is a job for knights. Have fun you all. They were silent as they left, leaving our sights. I could hear the sounds of battle beyond, and it was nothing but a slaughter. Without having to worry about the scout, everyone could simply focus on the battle without taking any risks. I had made this mission several levels easier with that single well-placed shot. Well, I guess boring missions are good missions. Umara crossed her arms. I could tell she was eager to let some of her fancy magic loose, but she was staying by my side just in case. I hugged her close, smiling as she automatically snuggled into my chest. Inwardly though, I had the random thought that perhaps I should try and find a guitar. I used to play it on earth all the time, so for moments like these, it would be good entertainment. Besides, chicks loved the guitar. Maybe this world had one. Otherwise I'd have to get one custom ordered. Though I didn't exactly know everything about a guitar's design, I knew enough of the important details like the types of strings it used. In my head I started to ponder, but as the battle continued outside, I had an odd feeling grow into an ominous one. Using my aura, I felt around but couldn't sense the presence of anyone nearby. But the threatening feeling within me kept growing until suddenly, it screamed at me. My coat activated, bringing everything to a slow as I grabbed Umara, throwing our bodies out of the APC. Boom. It exploded behind us, a wave of magicka washing over our bodies and launching us several more feet. I looked back, seeing a massive hole going from the front of the APC to the seats that we had just been sitting in. It was like a laser had melted a hole through it, destroying the white crystal powering it in the process of trying to kill us. My mind instantly processed what had happened and started hypothesizing. Was this the doing of those nobles? The other squad was still out there fighting, so did they hire a third party? Did they hire a hunter? Perhaps a warlock or a knight with an enchanted bow. But the strike was instantaneous. The only thing I could liken it to was a laser. There was no arrow, so if it were a warlock, they had to be incredibly powerful. However, after thinking for a few seconds, I took a glance through the melted hole. And in the distance beyond, on the side of a hill, there was a tall, uncannily gaunt entity staring at us. And it had a single massive eye that covered its entire face obvious even from a distance. My hair stood on end, a single word running through my mind, something reiterated during our briefing several times. Run. And NBSP. End chapter 73, Run. That time an American was reincarnated into another world by SP4DE. Chapter 74, Confidence. Even as I realized that the lives of every person here may be forfeit, I still maintained my telepathic connection with Umara and it seemed that she was able to feel my panic. It's the single-eyed scout. Shit. I could sense Umara's initial panic turn to dread. At the same time, I suddenly saw a twinkle from the direction of the scout. I grabbed Umara once more, throwing ourselves behind the cover of the truck. ZZT. The laser shot right past us, burning a hole where we were not even a second ago. After that, there were several shouts. That's an authority seven. Everyone retreat now. Scatter to the hills. Fuck. Run. All the knights started to sprint. The fastest ones were already halfway up the hill before anyone else could even get to the base. At the same time, I tapped my aerial, pulling up the puppet master's profile. But when I dialed in, the call never went through. Fuck. John. Umara. Right here. I yelled in response, subsequently hearing a thud as Faden, Vetsman, and Tana all landed near us taking cover behind the truck. With a thought I grabbed Faden, pulling him in. You grab Omara. 
we need to run to cover. This thing's attacks land instantly, so you can't expose yourself for too long. There's a forest nearby, so head to it. Got it. Vetsman. I'm with you. Tana, I have a mission for you. I grabbed her next, bringing her close. My aerial isn't working, and we need to contact the base. Do you remember the way back? Why yes. Good. I need you to get there as fast as possible. Deliver the message, and get us a rescue team. Can you do that? Yes. She looked hesitant, perhaps not wanting to leave us behind. But I had to at least guarantee that, so long as we survived long enough, we would get rescued. Without getting the message over, we might not survive unless we made it back to base ourselves. And I didn't think we would be able to outrun that scout so simply. After all, who said the other scout wouldn't have escorts? If the escorts were on the same level, I couldn't help but think we were fucked either way. But we had to try. After nodding to Tana, I looked at everyone else. Attract the attention of anything looking at us. Tana, you focus on getting out first. Use people as bait if you have to. Just get to the base. Ready? Yes. All right. Go. I yelled, and everyone shot out from behind the truck. Phaedon, the fastest, grabbed Umara and held her against his body while dashing like a bolt of lightning. Vetsman grabbed me as well, bounding with obscene strength to ascend the hill. He wasn't as fast as Phaedon, but that was exactly why I had him carry me instead. And as he seemed to fly through the air, every impact with the ground causing me to grunt in pain, I managed to peek over and get a look at what we were dealing with. The other APC, which some people had tried to start and run off with, was rapidly decommissioned with a laser. After that, several beasts emerged and tore it open. These beasts were much bigger than the other wolves. They were clearly of canine origin, but instead of being as large as a wolf, they were as large as a bear. They weren't as fast due to that, but they seemed impossible to kill with their fur that looked like metal bristles. And their ferocious look was by no means an exaggeration of their abilities as they tore the APC apart like it was plastic. As for the scout, it was undoubtedly the fastest of the group. It was able to charge up and down the mountain with ease, firing its laser at any escaping soldiers. And what I saw clearly painted the difference between an Authority 5 soldier and an Authority 5 elite from the Magisterium. The student knights all scattered in different directions, their legs carrying them with uncanny agility. Whenever the scout tried to fire at them, they were always able to dodge. They didn't have to even take a glance back. They simply kept running, and because of that, they were the first to evacuate the immediate range of the beasts. The soldiers, while strong, weren't as amazing as the students. They didn't match them in strength, agility, or stamina. There were only two soldiers who were able to make decisions fast enough to escape immediate death and keep up, and those two were Authority 6. This hunt wasn't supposed to surpass a certain level, and it was nearby the base as well. Anything as strong as the Authority 7 scout wasn't supposed to appear, especially not this close. Even then, an Authority 7 warlock was still assigned to our detachment as our leader. However, he alone couldn't handle all those beasts, let alone save us in the process. He had already ascended the hill, launching out various spells to try and suppress the scout. But it was clear that the laser was a great threat to him as he always hunkered down whenever he attracted its attention. Soon, everyone who wasn't killed in the first several seconds was able to ascend the hill. And in the distance, there was a dense forest. Everyone made a beeline for it, having the same idea as me. More coverage meant that we would be able to prolong our lives. Phaedon and Vetsman didn't need to be told anything dashing off as soon as they saw the forest. As for Tana, she was already well ahead of us. Although she couldn't compare to Phaedon's sheer speed, she had more stamina and could cross a longer distance faster than anyone on the team. It was exactly why she was our scout. She didn't even bother with the forest, diverging in another direction and disappearing over some hills. A few lasers were fired her way in the process, but she was able to dodge them all. Her aura definitely wasn't lacking. Once I lost sight of her, I turned back to the scout. It continued to try and kill soldiers and students, and it managed to get a few of the soldiers while they ran to the forest. By now, eight of the initial twelve soldiers had perished, only the best of them surviving. And none of the elites had died. I felt that we had done pretty good. However, as I looked back and focused on the wolves, I suddenly felt my neck tingle. I yelled. Dodge. Ha. Vetsman and Phaedon jumped without hesitation. However, 
I still saw that beam of light flash right under me. It pierced straight into Vetsman's leg, as if his armor didn't even exist. ZZT. Ack. Shit. We went tumbling through the treeline, but the big man kept his hold on me and jumped right back up despite the injury. Keep going. He yelled, pushing through with even greater strength as we disappeared into the trees. We lost sight of all the other soldiers and elites, only the sound of that Authority 7 warlock doing light battle with anything that came near him. We slowed down considerably having to dodge all the plant life, but after a while of running, we got to a point where I no longer felt threatened. That's when I announced. Hey. We're good. Stop here. Ugh. Vetsman grunted as we came to a stop, putting me down before going to the floor. His breathing was labored and his face scrunched in agony. Let me see. I jumped around and took a look, seeing how the armor had basically melted to his skin around the entry wound. The hole wasn't large and didn't go all the way through, but it was still deep and couldn't completely seal itself up. Under normal circumstances I would tie off the leg so it would stop bleeding, but the wound had been mostly cauterized by the attack anyway. Plus, Vetsman was a knight. Certain medical practices simply wouldn't work on someone like him. Still, I looked inside the wound to assess the damage. And I saw a little bit of white, an indication of the bone. It grazed the femur, but only slightly. The only real damage is to the muscles. Do you have recovery pills? Yet. He nodded, waving his hand and taking one out. Mine weren't potent enough to do much for him. It was good that he came prepared. I did have something though. I took out my foaming device, locking a canister into place before spraying it into the wound. I filled it completely, letting it foam up and seal it. It had some numbing properties and would at least prevent anything undesirable like bleeding, or infection if that was even possible for someone like him. All right. That'll prevent bleeding even while moving. It'll hurt, but it's still functional. You can push through it, because I sure as hell can't carry you. Ha, huh, yet. He let out a shuddering chuckle, beginning to calm down as the wound stabilized. After that, I looked up, scanning the forest around me. Asterisk a woo. Asterisk. The call of a wolf echoed, likely indicating that it had found some unfortunate prey. We had to avoid that if we wanted to live. I let out a long breath. I don't know how long it will take for help to come. We need to keep making distance though. Scouts are meant to find people regardless of the terrain. This forest won't help us that much. Besides, I have a feeling it was particularly interested in us. I noticed that. Umara suddenly chimed in. Of all the people it could have targeted out in the open, it had to choose us, who were inside the APC. It shot at us again afterward. I have a feeling it deliberately targeted the white crystal inside the APC first since its shot wasn't actually directly toward us. But the second time, it was definitely going for us. I don't know why, but we have to assume the worst. We can't let it find us, or things will become much more difficult. Let's go then. Vetsman grabbed a nearby rock, pushing himself up. I stood with him, looking in the direction opposite from where we came. And we started walking. I focused on my aura as we did so, keeping track of anything negative that I felt. We likely wouldn't be able to see our enemy if it started to come close, so I was now acting as a living threat detector. Unfortunately, we didn't even pass ten minutes before I suddenly felt my spine shudder, turning around. Dodge. Shit. Everyone jumped as my coat suddenly activated, dilating time. With a glance, I saw the scout about 50 yards away, looking right at me. I used all my strength to move behind cover, but it wasn't fast enough. I couldn't move faster than light. And I watched as its eye flashed, a laser suddenly appearing and shooting straight for the center of my chest. It hit my coat, and for a second, I felt utter dread and desperation. But it faded just as quickly when I saw smoke rise from the leather feeling no pain in my chest. Hey. John. I heard Umara scream as my momentum threw me to the side behind a rock. I almost couldn't process it for a second, but my coat had in fact eaten that shot like it was a laser pointer on a keychain. Hat. He 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 he. I couldn't hold back the laugh, feeling inexplicable. A coat that could block the laser attack from an Authority 7 scout that could pierce through Vetsman's armor. Maxwell, you son of a bitch. How far into your debt was I? Several thoughts and emotions ran through my mind all at once, but none of it could compare to the overwhelming confidence that had appeared because of this piece of clothing. So with a thought, 
I jumped out from behind cover and found the scout. And without a word I sprinted toward it, weaving between the trees, and reaching it in mere seconds. In my hand appeared a grenade. When I was only ten yards away from it, I pulled the pin, loosening my fingers and letting the trigger fly off with a cling as a large chunk of my psyche was stripped away. I held it for two seconds before tossing it toward the scout and dipping behind a nearby tree. Bang! Scree! The scout screamed, not dead, but injured. After that I grabbed a trench gun and flew out from behind the tree. I found the scout, still stumbling from the impact of the grenade but still getting ready to escape. However, with a bit of time dilation, I was able to aim right at its leg and pull the trigger. Boom. SCRE. Boom. After I blew off its long leg I targeted its torso and arms. It stumbled to the floor while trying to defend itself, but my shotgun only blew off chunks of its flesh in the process. Then I saw its eye flash. I reflexively turned my head right before the beam appeared, letting it singe my coat instead of my face. I felt warmth as it lasered me for several seconds in desperation. But once the light disappeared and I appeared unscathed, I went right back to shooting it. I let off six rounds in quick succession, the slam fire working its magic as two more of its limbs flew off. It continued to scream all the while, probably calling for help as it had bit off more than it could chew. This thing was an Authority 7, but it was dedicated entirely toward scouting, shooting that laser beam, and running. It had no defensive abilities at all, especially considering how it was a warlock-type beast. Boom. Asterisk scree. Asterisk. That's right, you lanky piece of shit. I walked up to it after it had already been blown to pieces. Blood sprayed everywhere as it unsuccessfully scrambled around. It didn't even have the energy to shoot. And without hesitation, I took out a shotgun shell and slotted it directly into my empty chamber, closing it before placing the barrel against the top of its chest where its neck sat. Boom. With that shot I separated its head from its body, leaving its giant eye completely untouched. And I grabbed the head by some loose skin throwing it into my spatial sack before running back. I appeared covered in blood, but didn't give my squad any time for questions before yelling. Let's go. We need to get the hell out of here. End NBSP. End Chapter 74, Confidence. That time an American was reincarnated into another world by SP4DE. Chapter 75, Stark Difference. Umara stared, her eyes wide and her mind going blank as John was hit with that laser. She didn't know what his coat was capable of. It had only ever defended itself against Authority 4 beasts, and even he didn't know how expensive it was. But there was no way it could defend against an attack that melted through both the armor of an APC and Vetsman's personal armor, which was undoubtedly of extremely high quality. How could that soft leather possibly compare? All she saw was the flash, and then, he fell back over some cover, disappearing from her view. She wanted to run over, but Phaedon grabbed her before she could pulling her behind some trees. After that, several seconds went by. And each second, she felt like she was screaming inside of her head, desperately trying to get John to respond. The fact that his telepathy, which was supposed to be constantly connected to her, was silent made her realize that this time, he really might be dead. The last time, he had almost died due to circumstances that had been entirely preventable. Now, it was like fate had simply decided to take him from her, leaving no room for contest. It was unfair. It was damnable. She felt overwhelming hatred. It was unacceptable for something like this to happen. The Scourge wasn't allowed to hurt those she cared about, let alone kill them without consequence. It was a cancerous tumor that needed to be excised from this world, yet doing so demanded a price in blood. And she was suddenly willing to pay it. Mana exploded within her body as she pried herself from Phaedon's grasp. The air under her feet then carried her forward, ready to shoot her toward that scout. The elements around her began to respond to her hatred, priming themselves to explode forth with power backed by her mana. The very atmosphere bent to her will. It didn't matter if it would cost her life, she would kill that beast. But then, just as she made her conviction, she saw John dash out from behind his cover. She froze, watching as he ran over to the scout and pulled out a grenade. She could sense his psycho fill it to the brim as he pulled the pin and threw it and she saw as the scout did little to defend itself against the odd weapon it couldn't recognize. And as if they didn't exist, her worries faded away. Bang! The grenade exploded, and John pulled out his trench gun. She watched from the side as he dismembered the scout, watched as it writhed on the floor after he blasted off an arm and a leg, 
desperately trying to flee. And it let off another laser, making her panic once more. Yet John did nothing to dodge it, simply letting it hit him. And the laser landed on his coat for several seconds, the beast screaming in anger, yet not damaging even a single hair on his body. He was completely immune to its attacks. After that, she simply stood there as he killed it and took its head as a trophy. How simple. It was almost effortless. Its head was removed from its body as if it were never a threat in the first place, like it hadn't killed ten other soldiers before it. She didn't know what to say. Even when he ran back, giving them the order to start running again, she remained silent. Was she shocked? Was she relieved? Was she scared? The emotions within her rampaged. From having lost her boyfriend, her lover, to watching him kill that beast like it was a chicken sent inexplicable waves throughout her mind. The sorrow, the hatred, the happiness. All of it coalesced as she was carried. And when she felt his telepathic connection reappear in her mind, when it spurred the memories of his figure as he killed what should have been a lethal threat to their entire convoy, she seemed to realize what she felt. Yet it felt so natural that she almost didn't acknowledge it, as if there was nothing to acknowledge since it should have always been there. She turned her head, seeing Vetsman strenuously carry John on his back. It was putting the big man through a lot of pain, but it was still faster than if John ran himself. She watched John, seeing his green eyes through the narrow opening between his hood and mask. He didn't look back at her. He was too focused. He always seemed to flick a switch whenever they entered combat. There was no room for any romance during that time. He didn't even have sympathy for the guy carrying him, simply ordering it since that's what they needed, and since he knew Vetsman could do it despite the pain. And when she calmed down and thought about it, she decided to save her words for later. It was something that she wouldn't regret no matter when she said it, but it might still place John into a bit more of a precarious situation. But it didn't matter to her when she did. All that mattered was that they were together, and that the time would come in the future where she wouldn't ever have to worry about the thoughts or opinions of others. There would come a time when anyone who dared to challenge their relationship would be put down by her personally. And until that time, anyone who dared to undermine her position by his side, or his by hers, would be met with the full wrath that her status afforded her, the very same status that they were all trying to greedily claim for their own gain. Now, even the tiny amount of doubt within the deep recesses of her mind had been washed out like a dusty corner. And she smiled contentedly, staring at him as if there were no other person in the world. I tapped my aerial, calling the puppet master. And sure enough, the call went through this time. John. Yeah, it's me. We're on our way. Where are you? I'll send you my location. I scrolled through the screens in front of me. Normally, without connection to a node, an aerial would lose its ability to geology okay since it required the node as a reference point. But because I regained my lost connection, it worked as if I were in a city. Soon enough, I sent our location to the puppet master. After that he hung up, saying he was only five minutes out. I sighed in relief. I no longer felt any threat to my life, so my squad had stopped running and started relaxing. Without the scout, the rest of the beasts probably weren't so eager to pursue us. Even if they were, they had obviously lost us. I saw Umara casting some air magic, so she had probably dispersed our scent or scattered our trail. Regardless, I felt perfectly safe so I had no issue acting like it. I let Vetsman relax. That foam came in handy, otherwise he would have started bleeding again with all that movement. And although it was painful, he got through it well. The man was tough as nails, as a knight should be. All of his training was paying off. As I took a seat though, I saw Umara walk over to me. She didn't say a word as she straddled me, wrapping me in a deep hug. For a while I was worried. But my telepathy told me that she wasn't fearful or stressed. She was calm. After a few minutes she shifted from a hug to a cuddle, allowing me to stroke her hair, which I enjoyed doing. Her pale face underneath her ashy hair looked positively beautiful. I smiled, thinking of nothing but how pretty she was and how much I adored her presence. The only thing that could interrupt us was our rescue. Three APCs rolled up to the treeline that we had stopped by. Once we saw them underneath the afternoon sky, we all got up and met with them. Are you guys okay? Tana came running over first, checking on all of us with a worried expression. I could clearly see how tired she was. To desperately cross such a distance knowing our lives depended on it must have put extreme strain on her body. She already looked sickly, her legs shaky and weak. Yet she quickly noticed Vetsman and his wounds despite that, 
hurrying over to check on him. Oh God! What happened? The scout got me, but I'm fine. Are you sure? Tana worriedly asked about him, causing me to openly jump and cheer silently nearby. What the hell are you doing? That excited to see me. Oh, hi. My mood disappeared as I turned to the puppet master, giving him a handshake. Thanks for coming. M.M. Good job surviving. Those Cyclops scouts are extremely deadly, yet they always like to linger around. They rarely show, but when they do it's usually a bloodbath. Where are the others? No idea. Everyone who survived the initial assault dispersed into this forest. They could be anywhere, probably being chased by the escorts. I see. A moment. The puppet master suddenly walked off, standing in an open area before taking out a staff. After a few seconds, he raised it and tapped it on the ground, causing a ripple of light to spread out. It highlighted every animal and creature in the forest for miles around, dead or alive. We could all see it, as if we had all been granted X-ray vision. And it revealed some ongoing fights as well as several human corpses. He yelled. Go assist our men. Move out, now. Roger. All of the soldiers from the APCs ran off, several of them being Authority 7, two of them being Authority 8. They disappeared into the distance within moments, assisting those who were still alive. After that, the puppet master pointed to one of the corpses before waving. I saw as the Cyclops scout's corpse flew over from the distance, landing before him, every dismembered limb included. He stared at it for a few seconds before looking at me. And I took out its intact head, causing him to scoff. What a fucking monster. Did you kill it by yourself? Yes. How? I silently responded by lifting the collar of my coat. It couldn't hurt me. Tisk. Talk about buying a second life. Well I gotta be able to match those rich nobles somehow. No shit. Hey, all of you. He suddenly called the rest of my squad, grouping them together. I'm required to ask. Did John single-handedly kill the scout? If any of you contributed even slightly, I need to know. Yes, he killed it by himself. M.M. We didn't help. Everyone confirmed the reality, causing him to sigh. Very well. John, you're about to accumulate some more notoriety. Yet? How many points is this worth? It's not about the points. You're the first person in Magisterium history to personally kill an Authority 7 while being three levels below it. Although this is one of the only enemies of the Scourge that have defenses so slim at such a level to even be capable of dying by your hands, that fact still remains. Not to mention that you're a mere summoner. However, this will not go through easily. He grumbled, taking the head from my hands. At least it's completely intact. Still, you all will be questioned under truth to confirm what happened here. I'll be keeping the remains as evidence of your fight with it as well. Vizan. Come heal Vetsman's wound. He called, and Vizan brought Vetsman over to one of the vehicles, inspecting and treating his leg. The puppet master turned back to us. Go rest. You won't have any more missions for the rest of your time here. Once we find everyone, we'll bring you back to base. All right. We all walked off, gathering around one of the APCs. Faden pat my back. Congratulations. And thank you. There's no reason to thank me. Don't be so humble. That thing might have been the death of us if you hadn't handled it. Even I was scared for a bit. He mumbled, causing me to nod. I had been scared too. Faced with something that could so easily kill us, that had so easily killed several soldiers, I was afraid for both myself and my squad. I had ignored that fear as soon as we started running, but it was still there. If anything, the fear fueled my focus and determination. And as soon as I discovered that I could fight that thing, I did so without hesitation. If I didn't, we would still be on the run, and we couldn't have done that for too much longer. Vetsmon had been reaching his limits and there were wolves that none of us could kill on the way. The fact that I could kill it was a miracle, one that I had capitalized on perfectly. Still, I didn't necessarily face it because I hated the Scourge and wanted to kill them. I faced it because the fear of being overwhelmed after running ourselves down to our limits was scarier than the fear of fighting the core of the threat head-on when I had the advantage. Not to mention how all of this was only possible because my life had been paid for and secured by Maxwell back when he gave me this coat. He bought me a second life, as the puppet master stated. I was grateful but also painfully aware of my own mortality and how a beast just a few levels above me could so easily kill me. 
and it would take power far above even that beast's in order to secure my life against those kinds of surprises. The leather of my coat came from a beast that could easily defend against the attack of an Authority 7. I truly wondered what kind of monstrous creature Maxwell used to make this thing, and how much it cost to make this coat. Millions? Tens of millions? Either way, I owed him far more than I could ever repay. Omara continued to cling to me as we waited for the survivors. In the process of the rescue, several of those beastly wolves were killed and brought back. And after about an hour, the casualties had been counted. All elites from the Magisterium survived. And of the thirteen soldiers who left, only three survived. It was unfortunate, but the stark difference was apparent. There was a reason Magisterium students demanded respect even when they left and entered the military. This was the reason why. They surpassed those of a similar level, especially the elites. Only the Authority 7 and two Authority 6 soldiers had survived. Every one other soldier, 10 Authority 5s, had been killed. And most of them had been killed in the initial attack or while running into the forest. Everyone was solemn as all the recoverable corpses were loaded. After that, we drove back to base. I was glad to have Omara there with me to soothe my soul. I knew that things would only get worse as I continued down this path, but so long as I was going to walk it, I was grateful to have her by my side. And NBSP. End Chapter 75, Stark Difference. That time an American was reincarnated into another world by SP4DE. Chapter 76, Target. I woke up to the sound of shallow breathing, as well as some moisture on my chest. My eyes fluttered open to see the rail car around me, filled with couches and chairs and tables, of which were occupied by sleeping elites. And laying on my chest was Umara, the drool from her mouth being soaked up by my shirt as her light breath tickled my neck. I smiled and shifted, hugging her body comfortably as I simply relaxed. Over the last few days on base, I had noticed a bit of a change in her demeanor. She looked at me with a bit more, passion. It was also a bit more difficult to get her flustered. Usually my public shows of affection caused her to blush profusely while attempting to hide. It was pretty easy to tease her that way. But now, it was like she didn't mind. She still got embarrassed, but she no longer hid from it. If anything she seemed to welcome it, starting to reciprocate by kissing me back or walking around with our arms linked. By all means, it was welcome. But I couldn't help but wonder what spurred the change, and why. I could clearly sense her feelings, but she was more confident now and our practice with telepathy meant that she had learned to conceal her deeper thoughts. The details I could glean were fewer. Not only that, but I had run some tests, both with and without her. For one, when she was sleeping like this, linking to her mind would immediately make her conscious. I had woken her from three naps that way, much to her irritation. I had a feeling that this phenomenon had to do with the lack of dreaming people in this world experienced. After asking her about it, I confirmed that dreaming was an extremely rare occurrence in this world. Whereas I had been dreaming almost every night, Domara had never had a dream before. The only thing close to that was when she was being enlightened, but that experience wasn't much of a dream. However, I also discovered that, maybe because there was no dreaming, they needed less time to sleep as six hours was enough for most people to feel completely refreshed. Regardless, linking to Umara's mind woke her up by activating her consciousness, whether it was a defense mechanism or not. Secondly, there was a certain range I could use our telepathy within. We had tested it on a field, maintaining the connection while slowly increasing the distance between us. The result was that I could maintain my telepathy with her anywhere within the base. Even when she moved beyond my sight and around buildings to reach the opposite end of the base, I was still able to communicate freely with her. However, disconnecting from that connection and attempting to reconnect proved to be impossibly difficult. The reason for that was due to the interference of other minds. My aura was visualized as a foggy medium, like a long wispy cloud. I was able to extend this cloud to great distances, but because it wasn't very solid, it could be distorted by obstacles. This included the minds of others as well as their auras, at least the auras of those who were aware of theirs, which was uncommon. Finding Umara in that mess was beyond me right now unless there were no obstructions or interference. As for the maximum distance we could maintain the connection at, we hadn't yet found out. The only other experiments we carried out were in regard to the type and volume of information that could be sent over telepathy. For one, images couldn't be sent. Or, perhaps they could, but I wasn't able to see them yet. As for volume, that proved to be finicky. Telepathy inserted words directly from one mind into another. 
there was no need to process it like sensory information. However, things could get overwhelming very quickly. I've caught glimpses of Omara's inner thought process before, and the amount of information I received over mere seconds was enough to make me blank. Most minds were like that. Inner thinking, depending on the person, could happen at a speed far greater than anything we could communicate externally. Every thought was associated with the senses while simultaneously being linked to a dozen other thoughts and memories. A brain could process terabytes of information on a whim. And the only reason I was able to process some of her bursts of uninhibited thought was due to my own speed of thought which vastly surpassed hers. Still, a lot of the information was garbled, like files trying to reference others that didn't exist while forgetting others fractions of a second later. Still, it made me realize that telepathy had great potential. Only, I was reminded of one issue. Plex once told me that I had to carefully pick a path to take my aura, because once I found an ability for it, I wouldn't be able to go back and learn another. And I had a sinking feeling that telepathy was an ability that I had inadvertently yet irreversibly picked. I didn't mean to. It simply came to me and I had been too interested in it to let it be. I had been training and using it every day since then and it was becoming well developed. It was possible that, from now on, this would be the shape my aura took, and the only ability I would have. So much for invisibility. Part of me felt like I was losing out, but it wasn't like telepathy was a bad ability. It was a high-level form of communication and I knew that I was only scratching the surface of its true potential. After all, I had developed this power on the assumption that aura was an extension of one's magical power. And things were working in that direction. So this meant I might be able to exploit it. For example, if my summons were reliant on a direct connection to my mind and psyche, then by using my aura as a medium, I could separate them from my body and allow them to function in the hands of another person. Perhaps my telepathic connection would be the thing to allow something like that. After trying I found that I couldn't, but that didn't mean I wouldn't be able to in the future. Extending Psyche and the abilities of my mind beyond my body. That was my power, and I intended to do much more with it than just telepathy. These thoughts all ran through my head as I relaxed with Umara in my embrace. I glanced down at her, letting out a small chuckle. Not a single thought between those eyes, hey. I combed back some of her hair before stroking her scalp. At some point, I sensed her wake, but she simply kept her eyes closed and enjoyed the sensations. We were like that for another hour until everyone around us started to wake as well. The ride home took about a day, and when we docked in the terminal, it was late in the afternoon. We disembarked and went back to the magisterium where we were welcomed by students and parents alike. Elites, gather! The puppet master shouted, drawing us all in. He scanned all of us before announcing. Congratulations, especially to our top two squads, who survived an unexpected ambush by an Authority 7. All your training managed to keep you alive, along with the exemplary actions by John Cooper, who single-handedly killed that Cyclops scout. Let this be an example of how easily a situation can turn dire, as ten soldiers were lost in that ambush and several of our elites sustained injuries. You may be better than the average, but in front of your superiors, you are still no more than chickens. He spoke with solemnity, turning the mood serious. But then, he sighed. Keep it in mind, but don't let it cloud your head with fear. Today, your Christmas vacation starts, so all of you are dismissed. Be with your families and appreciate what you have been blessed with. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. We all chimed back, dismissed with those words. This time, the Duchess wasn't here nor were my friends from work, so Umara and I took our luggage back to our rooms. That's when I received a well-timed call. It was from Plex. Hey Plex. Hello John. Since you're back early, I come with some news and a request. I sat down, curious about the news. The major auction accompanied by Vatsi's Christmas Gala is coming up in three days so as to end four days before the new year. This is the biggest auction of the year and there's plenty of work to be done. I was hoping you would be able to come in and assist us. Oh. Sure. I accepted readily. I needed to make some money anyway and fill the fat gaps in my bank account once again. Good. I'll see you tonight then for the first set of jobs. The day after tomorrow we also have a job from Apic Ryan, so we'll all be tackling that together. Oh. Great. Indeed. It's amazing pay though, and this time, you'll be getting a larger portion. Anyway. I have another piece of news. Patriarch Taver requests your presence as soon as you can make time. Go talk to him before you come in for work tonight. M.M. 
I agreed, wondering what the Patriarch wanted from me. Well, that's all the news I have for you. Clear your schedule because we'll be busy until the auction. Click. He hung up with those words, leaving me pondering. Not long after that, Omara knocked and entered my room. I looked up at her, smiling. Hey. Hey. I have a message for you. Oh. Yet another piece of news. I took an envelope from Omara's outstretched hands. Her face was a bit rosy, but I didn't think into it that much as I looked at it. The envelope was closed with a wax seal, addressed specifically to me, the seal carrying the regalia of the Talaria dukedom. I broke the wax and pulled out a parchment, unfolding the white paper and reading the fancy cursive writing. John Cooper. You are hereby invited to the Christmas family gathering of the Talaria family, beginning two days before Christmas Eve, and ending the morrow after Christmas Day. You will take up residence at the Talaria mansion within the city of Jofrun and participate in any gatherings the Talaria family attends for the duration of your stay. Your transportation will be arranged for the evening before the day of your planned arrival, and you will be accompanied by the first daughter Umara Talaria. We look forward to your arrival. Signed, Duchess Talaxia Talaria, Duke Ikhor Talaria. I stared at the letter for a few seconds after finishing before looking up at Umara standing before me. She gave me a weird smile. Merry Christmas. Ha, this is quite the surprise. No kidding. Rest assured though their intentions are genuine. You're being invited to spend Christmas with the family, no drama, or politics attached. How nice. Let your mother know that I appreciate it and that I look forward to it. I will. I'm glad that we'll be able to spend Christmas together. I initially thought we'd have to celebrate early, or late. She mumbled while taking a seat on my bed beside me, resting her head on my shoulder. I looked at the invitation some more before stowing it back into the envelope. I intended to keep this. Then. I thought about how my schedule would be rather packed from now on. I nudged Umara. I've got some business to take care of over the next few days. We're preparing for the Black Spider auction, so for the next three days I'll be delivering items. The day after is the auction itself. And speaking of, would you care to accompany me to it? Oh. Yes. I'd love to go. She nodded instantly, making me smile. All right. The day after though is when we have to leave. At least it's in the evening, so we'll have some time to recover. M.M. By the way, the knights and I were called in for questioning in regards to you killing the Cyclops scout. It'll happen tomorrow. Sure. Let me know how it goes. I will. And. Oh, wait. She suddenly sat up, remembering something. There's a noble gathering the day of the auction. It's an early Christmas gathering, meant to occur during the evening. The auction goes off during the evening. Oh well. After thinking for a second, she just shrugged. I didn't really want to go anyway. Let's just attend the auction. If that's what you want. The auction is also accompanied by Vatsis Gala, so there will be a party afterward that will go on into the morning. That long. Well, everyone is usually gone or passed out by that time, but yes. Oh. Sounds fun. She nodded her eyes sparkling in curiosity. I chuckled, thinking how cute her inquisitive nature was. After discussing all the details of each event, we settled on a schedule that would make things work. However, there was still one variable that might put a spin on things. After hanging out for a few more hours, we separated so I could go make a stop. I entered the Founders Market, making my way to the Tavera territory. Soon enough, I had an audience with Patriarch Tavera. Ah, John. It's good to see you in good health, though I notice you've come back with some trophies. It's been an eventful few months. I shook his hand as he noticed my new scars, taking a seat with a smile. Indeed. I've heard many rumors. They're probably true. Haha, <laughs> well, at least I know you've got balls. Which is good, because I have a difficult mission that I'd like for you to take on. The old man leaned forward, laying down a small stack of papers before me. I picked them up seeing a picture of a man. This is Hen of Urenz. He's a warlock affiliated with the Clockwork Association, not officially one of theirs, but a valuable asset. I want you to kill him. I was silent, my mood suddenly turning complicated. It was a hit, and I was being hired as the hitman. I looked at the man on the paper. He looked rather ordinary, with brown hair and blue eyes, he was a regular middle-aged man that wouldn't be noticed walking down a street. I frowned 
looking back up at the patriarch. Sir, I have an issue. Go on. I've killed a lot of people, primarily in the trenches, but not entirely. If I recall, that number has surpassed three digits. I've got a lot of blood on my hands, but as far as I'm concerned, none of it was innocent. Every single one of those people wanted to kill me, and I simply killed them first. So I would never in my right mind seek out an innocent man simply to rid someone, even you, of a financial competitor. Hmm, I see. The patriarch nodded, gradually bearing a smile. You have a strong set of principles. I respect that a lot more than someone who would do anything should it benefit them. Rest assured, John, this man is the furthest thing from innocent. Please, take a look at the other pages. I silently looked back down, seeing the other papers covered in images. Hennevue trades in people. He's responsible for running a shadow company that provides the association with a constant supply of slaves and corpses to fuel all of their experimentations. Since it was founded, the Clockwork Association has made significant progress in the field human alterations. Their advancements led to artificial limbs and better medical magic. But in their quest to mimic crowns, they've killed thousands in horrible experiments. Today, this side of their organization is hidden deeply as they've expanded into other businesses. However, they're making progress, and we've decided to put a little roadblock in their way. If you kill Hennevue, it'll hamper their supply of people, halt their progress, all while erasing a bloody human being. I admit, we have something to gain from this which is why I'm handing you the mission at all. But he is not innocent, that much I can assure you. You would be doing humanity a great deed by killing him. I went through the papers, reading about all kinds of personal details and seeing plenty of images about his dealings and whereabouts. Apparently he was preparing for the auction, which was why he was in town, making it the best time to kill him. However, he was also Authority 7. This meant that I had to utilize the element of surprise. But, what better person than me to do such a thing? I was still only Authority 4, but warlocks had weak flesh like summoners. The only thing that could protect him was his magic, but if he didn't have that activated, he would perish all the same. I would still have to be careful, but it was definitely possible for me to pull this off. And since he really was a criminal, a human trafficker at that, then it was no question that he deserved to die. I read for another minute or so before looking up at the patriarch. All right. I'll do it. Fantastic. The payout for this job is twofold. This man has a bounty on his head. Just check the Black Spider repository. That alone is worth 190,000 coin. And my personal payment will match that, making for 380,000 coin. And if you happen to loot anything from his corpse, it will be yours. Wow. That's very generous. And yet the benefits to the Tavera family will outweigh such a cost heavily. This man is smart, calculating, and meticulous. He has been the broker for the Clockwork Association for five decades, a veteran in his field. But my hopes are hinging on the fact that not even he could prepare himself for you. The name American has become a small legend within the market. So go and show them why. Will do. I stood with a smile, shaking his hand. I wish you luck, and take all the time you need. Don't take this target lightly, and perhaps someday, the Founders Market will be rid of this rat. And NBSP. End Chapter 76, Target. That time an American was reincarnated into another world by SP4DE. Chapter 77, Stock. After my meeting with Patriarch Tavera, I went for a few delivery commissions to kill some time and help out with the large list of gala deliveries since it was still early in the evening. However, I only completed a few jobs receiving a total payout of 50,000 before disappearing and starting my hunt. Hennevue Rents operated out of one particular warehouse in the city slums. That was supposed to be his holding area, but he didn't appear there often. He personally worked out of a nice housing complex within the Founders Market where he could easily make contact with the Clockwork Association. It wasn't uncommon for him to appear within their territory the few times he did appear. Thankfully, this major auction was bringing him out of hiding. The window to kill him would be small, but there was still something I needed to check. Trust but verify. The Tavera family apparently stood to gain quite a lot from Hennevue's death, though I wasn't sure how. But I wouldn't allow myself to be used to kill an innocent man. I would confirm for myself if this man was as heinous as Tavera made him out to be. It took me a while to get to the slums of the city. Even though they were called slums, they were simply less prosperous areas of the capital, still offering a modicum of comfort. 
instead of tall stone buildings, people lived in short wood houses and ran small shops. It was far more modest than the flashy colors and materials of the kingdom's central areas, even making me feel a little out of place. However, it wasn't enough to attract too much scrutiny. My coat was still drab enough that, disregarding anyone noticing the pulsing lines across its back, it just seemed a sound investment in clothing. Anyone who recognized me would probably come from the markets themselves, so I didn't worry about getting spotted. Besides, I could feel every gaze through aura. At most, there was some mild envy mixed in with brief curiosity. If there was anything out of place, I would know. A few wrong turns and fallible directions later, I finally found a side alley that led into a more desolate place. Under the faint light of the moon, it looked like an actual slum, seemingly abandoned buildings sat derelict and caked in dust, piles of trash forced me to navigate around them, stray animals lay despondent under collapsing overhangs. The actual infrastructure reminded me of a more dilapidated trenches, but was a definite improvement over the ever-present haze of drugs. The warehouse in question was a larger building, a careful veneer of neglect torn to shreds by the fact it was one of the only structures in the immediate area not half collapsed. After confirming I was at the proper location, I looked around for an overwatch position. I laid eyes on a two-story shop. Scaling another building next to it and using my enhanced strength, I leapt onto its roof, inwardly apologizing for the sudden thump that no doubt startled the inhabitants. Summoning my Remington Lee, I propped up the rifle in a comfortable position and laid down. Close to two hours later, I was starting to think Patriarch Tavera's intel had been mistaken. But just as I had resolved myself to move to another position, a wagon pulled up to a side door. A few people hopped out of it while another group exited from the building's side door. They exchanged a few words. One of the second group signaled to someone inside, prompting them to let the wagon through a large door. Thankfully, they didn't bother closing the door, possibly because they were in a hurry. Once the wagon stopped, they immediately started loading it. My heart rate, only just calming down from the wagon's initial appearance, spiked again. Two dozen people of all ages were herded from a cellar, all with various bruises and injuries. A few people, presumably knights, practically threw them in the back of the wagon, sealing the seamless back doors like there had never been a human trafficking operation at all. After that, two drivers drove the wagon away, heading deeper into the city. From a cursory assessment, those two drivers were only Authority 5 and 6. I sensed the strength of a knight from the Authority 5 and Mana from the other. If I wanted to, I could kill both. If I wanted to, 24 people could be freed. However, I had yet to find Hanavu. Tavera's evidence had provided more than enough proof to irrevocably link Hanavu with the worst of human scum. I was no longer worried about his connection in the slightest. My concern was alerting the man. If I ambushed his shipment midway, he might get worried. And the only way this assassination would work was if he was totally confident. I watched the wagon drive away my reticle hanging over the unsuspecting backs of the two men, the confidence to kill them beckoning me to pull the trigger. I could do it. I could save those people, sparing them from their fate as human experiments. The tortures they, and many like them, would suffer to provide the knowledge the association wielded, were known to none. This was the dark part of the black market. The truly dark part, not just the drugs or depravity. And yet, despite the fact I now held the fates of twenty-four people in my palm, I held back. I leapt off the building with a shuddering breath, assuming a steely expression. I didn't have a carriage, nor did I care to call and wait for one. Time was of the essence. I ran back to the founder's market, opting for side routes and shortcuts, occasionally glimpsing the carriage I was shadowing, my stamina boosting mask doing little to help the shuddering gasps my breaths eventually turned into. I slowed as I started creeping into clockwork association territory. Using my aura as a guide, I steadily made my way to Hanavia's residence, losing sight of the carriage in the process. Like last time, I found a good vantage point about 150 yards away and two stories higher than my target building. And through my scope, I waited. After an hour, I saw the wagon from before roll out of the association headquarters. It had beat me here, and now, it was empty. Those people I saw were now delivered, fated to be test subjects until they died because I chose not to save them but I forced those regretful feelings down and waited some more. And I laid there, rifle in hand, until the sun came up. I saw dozens of people come and go, mostly warlocks, but none matching the face of my target. Yet I stayed until the sun started to rise higher into the sky. It even started hurting to blink. Damn you! 
come out already. I cursed, and yet no matter how long I waited, Hanavya didn't come out. Perhaps he mediated the earlier exchange while I was on the way. Perhaps I had missed him. But I didn't want to leave. I needed to kill this man and I wouldn't leave until I did. So I remained on the rooftop. My vantage point gave me a clear view of where he made his exchanges. Taking out a cigar from my case and a leftover ration from my spatial sack, I took an irregular breath of smoke, calming my nerves and refueling my body. After about ten minutes of that, I put the trash away while stowing the cigar. I allowed myself to take a short nap. But when the alarm on my aerial went off an hour and a half later, I forced myself from grogginess, started smoking my cigar under the afternoon sun, and went back to watching. I kept my eyes on that building and the clockwork headquarters. I checked the face of every single person, my reticle resting softly on each in turn. I ignored the texts I got from Omara, Vetsman, Faden, and Plex. Nothing was in my mind except for this mission. And I stalked the area for seven hours. Every hour, I would bring out the page with Hanavu's face on it, reminding myself, despite the fact the bastard's visage was ingrained in my mind already. The sun set on the city as I waited. It'd been almost an entire day. My joints creaked, my legs cramped, and my spine shrieked for relief, but I shoved their concerns aside. Hanavu was bound to come out eventually, and I would not let my body's weakness prevent me from delivering righteous justice. And then, right as it started to become dark, my eyes widened. I saw him. Hanavu and two other men, walking into the headquarters. My agitation suddenly rose, compelling me take the shot then and there. But rationality won, purging my mind of everything except grim professionalism. I watched them discussing something while walking. Hanavu motioned to the area twice, likely indicating another shipment. He received nods of approval before the two parties separated. He was a long-time broker, so there probably wasn't much to discuss. The only reason he was out and about was because of the upcoming auction. Yet the man never stopped moving. I had confidence in my shot but wanted to be absolutely sure. One wrong move and I would lose my chance forever. So I watched as Hanavia walked right back into the headquarters and disappeared from my sight. I didn't panic or regret anything. I simply stayed there, watching the gates as night came. What was a little more waiting? Midnight soon passed, and dawn's light once again pierced the night. The timing was different, but sure enough, another shipment came. There it was, the same wagon with more people in it rolling down the street. From where I could see, it had a few more streets to go before it arrived at the exchange point. And in that time, Hanavu emerged. My heart pounded as I saw him walk out with another man. This man wore a heavily embroidered cloak, obviously high level, possibly even more so than Hanavu. But I didn't worry about him. He wasn't the target. All I cared about was killing Hanavu. The two strolled out into the street to wait for the wagon, utterly assured of their safety in the heart of clockwork territory. My heart rate increased once more. This was it. Taking a deep breath, I recalled the Remington Lee for my Springfield. A few ticks on the ladder sight was all I needed for a proper zero. Then, I calmed myself and took aim. 150 yards was a long way, but my senses were sharper and I could clearly see Hanavu. No matter what, my aim would be true and even if I didn't hit his head, I would hit center mass. Very little would throw my shot off. I made sure even the worst deviation would still kill. Just one second of stillness was all I needed. I was patient, even as that wagon only a street away continued to roll another group of people to their doom. Hanavu crossed his arms, laughing at a joke his companion told. I didn't feel resentment at the fact that he was enjoying himself. I didn't need to. All I could see were the faces of the people loaded into the wagon. My finger was steady as it stroked the trigger, as smooth as all the other times I fired this weapon and I let freedom ring. Boom. The explosion cracked through the surroundings, startling dozens. I watched as Hanavu's head exploded into a long stream of red mist and flesh. The man beside him jumped in shock, wildly flicking his head around as a defensive shield popped into existence. I crawled off the roof I laid on, unsummoning the rifle. I landed in an alleyway, preparing another ambush for the wagon going up the street. I waited for a short time letting them roll up to me before summoning my trench gun and firing. Boom boom. The warlock of the two drivers had his hasty shield vaporized by the 12-gauge slug, blowing off his head. And the knight could hardly handle one of those shots to the chest, flying off the wagon and too injured to rise again. Barely alive, the knight tried to crawl to his feet, 
feeble hands struggling to grasp a sword. I simply walked around as he blindly struggled, placing my barrel against his throat and sending him to the afterlife. With that, I walked around and blasted off the wagon's lock before throwing open the door. Inside, I saw another unfamiliar batch of people. Children and adults, but no elderly this time. They stared at me, terror evident on their faces as I stared back. I spoke. Get out and run, if you want to live. This is all I can do right now. Nobody responded, so I simply took off running. I only had one destination in mind, my feet taking me right back to the city slums. I panted as I slowed down near the warehouse, out of breath but filled with more than enough willpower to compensate. Through my aura, I felt only one person at Authority 6, a knight. Still, I walked up to the door with my trench gun in hand, placing it against the lock and pulling the trigger. Boom. The handle blasted inward, letting me kick open the door as I loaded a shell into the tube of my shotgun. The entire warehouse was alerted as people came rushing down. An Authority 5 warlock turned the bend on the stairs, a fireball already forming in his palms. I pointed my stick at him and squeezed. Boom. Splat. He folded over the new hole in his waist, collapsing into a bloody pool. Two Authority 5 knights rushed at me from a doorway, roaring in battle rage. I wasn't taking any chances. Boom 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 boom. A few seconds later, I realized I was racking the slide on an empty shotgun. A gory mess of armor was all that remained of the two. The Authority 6 was right behind them. Summoning as much Psyche as I could, I injected all of it into a grenade and lobbed it at the doorway. The knight arrived right as the grenade landed. Unfortunately for him, he didn't pay it any heed as he stepped forward, focused on me. You son of a... Boom. The grenade exploded underneath him right as I stepped behind a pillar. He somehow wasn't dead yet, despite collapsing on the floor. His armor had saved him, badly dented, but concussive forces were a bitch. He could hardly breathe from the sudden collapse of his lungs, nor was his face in much better condition. So I walked over to him and hand-delivered another grenade, stuffing it down his armor with a vengeance. His aura disappeared with another explosion. I couldn't feel anyone else containing power after that. So my legs guided me to a locked cellar door. With easy steps I went and broke the lock, throwing it open before seeing a stairway. I stepped down, getting hit with the pungent odor of human misery, disregarding it entirely as some lights flickered on. And there I saw it. Rows of cages, all of them containing people of varied ages. They all looked at me, more eyes full of fear. After a few seconds of processing what I saw, I put away the gun and stepped back up the staircase. I went over to the shell of the Authority 6, searching around before finding a barely intact set of keys. When I went back down, I simply went to each cage and unlocked them, throwing them open one by one. There were close to a hundred people, none of whom moved despite the wide open door. Once I unlocked the last one, I stood at the end of the cellar, the open stairway across from me. I've killed your captors. There is nobody here that can threaten you. Go. You are free now. I was met with silence. However, there were some people who had more confidence than others, willing to take their chances. Some of the men stepped out, looking at me before looking at the staircase. Before they left though, I suddenly reached out. Wait. They turned back to me, startled. I took out my bank card and withdrew small gold coins. I walked over with ten in hand, worth one thousand coin total, and placed it into one man's hand. And I did the same for the other two before stepping back. Hopefully that can get you through the next short while. Now go. Everyone else, step up, and I'll give you something. This time, people were more eager as the three men stumbled up the stairs. A crowd started forming around me as I rapidly deposited stacks of gold into their eager hands. One by one they went up the stairs, some in groups, others alone. I could feel the thoughts and emotions of every single person who walked up to me and slipped past me. Anxiety, hope, sorrow, dread, apathy. All of these people were ordinary. Not a single one had mana, vigor, or psycho within them. None could hide a single detail of their minds from me. It was all too vivid, like I was the one experiencing these things in their place. I could feel the pain of their bodies, the hunger, their beaten limbs, and I did nothing to stop myself from soaking it all in. Nobody spoke as each person came and went, all of them simply too scared to disturb the process on the slight chance that I might change my mind, too eager to receive and escape this place. But then I heard a soft voice. What's your name? 
I looked up, seeing a young emaciated woman who looked at me with determination in her eyes. Unlike the others, she carried happiness and hope, even some admiration. Whatever she had gone through, it hadn't broken her spirits yet. And she was the only one among this group that was both chained and had a crest on her hand, dozens of markings resembling slash marks, the indication of a knight. There was a bit of vigor within her. But it had been almost entirely exhausted. She looked like she was on the verge of death as she carried her heavy chains. Just call me the American. American. Thank you. I didn't respond. Instead, I took out a recovery pill and lifted it to her mouth. She looked at me and opened, letting me place it in so she could eat it. After that, I took out the keys that had been on the body of that authority six, undoing the chains that bound her wrists and ankles. They dropped with a clang, each of them incredibly heavy. She dropped to her knees on the side, recovering as I handed everyone else their money. Once she was feeling better, I handed her the money too. She looked at it for a second before clutching her hand and running out. I walked out behind her, exiting the warehouse. Everyone who had left already was gone, only a few in sight when I emerged, all of them rapidly disappearing behind buildings. I looked up to see the moon hanging bright in the sky. There was no happiness to be felt. Only regret over the fact that I hadn't been able to save more. That I had sacrificed a batch in order to secure my kill. That there were countless others before that one. And I didn't feel like receiving anything for it. So I simply walked home. I arrived at the Black Spider Hotel, entering the lobby where I saw the key master waiting, as always. His face was filled with concern and understanding. I had a feeling he knew exactly what had just happened. I recommend rest, John. Allow the night to cleanse your soul. M.M. Thank you, Key Master, for your hospitality. Of course. He gave a cursory bow, which I returned before heading up. The moment I hit the bed, consciousness was stolen away from me, like a candle in the wind. End Chapter 77, Stock. That time an American was reincarnated into another world by SP4DE. Chapter 78, Executioner. At. My eyes opened to an endless white expanse. There was no indication of direction, of texture, not even of depth. The mildly bright white gave no indications of, well, anything really. But it was not the apparent physical plane that caught my attention. A strange pull on my mind brought me, as a river might a boat, to my thoughts. I remembered all those children and adults from the warehouse, the ones I had saved. But those I couldn't save surfaced as well. Their faces, permanently etched into my memories, demanded retribution. Unbidden, a torrent of miseries erupted. I imagined hundreds, thousands who had all suffered the same fate. I imagined the atrocities committed in an attempt to discover the limits of the human body. But most prominently, I imagined endless rows of faces twisted into masks of agony, their eyes fearful and angry and confused. It was overwhelming. It was depressing. It, filled me with determination. I could save even more. I just needed information, and there were plenty of people to get it from. Tavera was just one person. There were hundreds of bounties on the repository, and surely there would be traffickers on that list. If I could do it, then I would. My guns gave me the power to kill even an Authority 7 warlock. Anybody below that level wouldn't be able to stop me. As I made my decisions, my surroundings shifted. I saw another warehouse, one full of even more trafficked people. They were in an even sorrier state than the ones I saved. I rushed forward, forgetting it was just a dream, eager to put down more scum. I could feel their captors around the building. I just needed to kill them. But, my body wouldn't listen to me. I simply stood there even as all those captors rushed down to meet the threat. There were Authority 6S, even an Authority 7 Knight. They were strong, not people I could fight against. I watched as they rushed from surrounding passages almost like rats from the woodworks. They rushed toward me, their hate-filled faces only loosely concealing a primal dread. They were scared. As if I wasn't there, they ran around and passed me. I turned around to follow them, watching as they stacked up into defensive formations, their typically unfayable authorities showing large cracks. A large metal door was blown off its hinges, merely a pebble to the explosive force of nature behind it. A badly mulched body, hardly recognizable as human flesh, flew with the door, both staggering the hastily formed battle line. A figure loomed in the doorway, blood-stained axe in hand. 
Silent screams of battle rage and anger rippled across the battle line as they began advancing upon the figure rushing at them. In a dance of violence, limbs flew, blood gushed, and bodies dropped as the person blew through night after night, warlocks and summoners blown aside by the thrown bodies of their comrades. The bloody axe left craters in finely crafted armors, a strange explosive force magnifying its effect by many times. Their best efforts, an otherwise incredible display of teamwork stemming from years of fighting together, were child's play to the paragon of violence that silenced them in seconds. And, without fail, the figure's final blow to every enemy was decapitation, dead or alive. An executioner. I simply watched as they were all dispatched with impunity. When silence reigned, a simple blow to each lock freed the captives from their cages. I slowly came to an understanding as I watched the person go about their work. I wasn't needed. This wasn't my duty. Whoever that executioner was, they were enough. I watched that person stand there. They wore a coat and hood, very similar to my own. All of a sudden, as if struck by some divine inspiration, they reached into their coat and pulled out a cartridge. My eyes widened. I was the only person who could give someone a cartridge. Who was it? It wasn't the key master, that was certain. So who could possibly have ammunition from me? And then, a faint pair of wings bloomed from the person's back, shrouding them in faint light. Ah, I see. Guardian Angel. I smiled, letting out a long breath as I closed my eyes. And the next time I opened them, I was back in my hotel room. I laid there in my bed while my mind processed everything that happened. This injustice wasn't the one I was meant to resolve. There was somebody else out there who I could trust to do it for me. My mind was cleansed of torment. The faces of the dead, once debilitating, now inspired me to continue on this path of mine. And in that moment of inspiration, I decided to pull out my advancement formation. I pulled up the first page and raised my hand, releasing my aura and tracing channels through the air. I watched as my finger traced recursively complex channels into my aura, almost like there was some other force guiding my hand and I was just along for the ride. The core of the formation sat before me, a faint wisp of active aura still trailing from my finger to where I had left it off. An entire third of the first formation was done. When considered among the entire advancement formation, only a tenth had been drawn, but the effects were incredible. I had been studying it for a while now and it seemed with this dream, I was able to make a leap. My mind churned as I finished what I could. My ocean of thought started to flow, small eddies and currents growing and merging into a whirlpool in my mind. Its movements were lethargic, considering the fraction of progress made, but the results were stunning. Everything about my thought process became faster, smoother, it felt like the cloudy barriers I once had to shove every thought through had finally been lifted and my mind could finally flow free. It felt amazing, and with this boost I finally wrapped my head around the situation. If it wasn't my calling, then so be it. I sat up after letting myself calm down. Several notifications from my aerial jolted me from my afterglow. The most recent one, from the key master on behalf of the Black Spider repository, was interesting. John Cooper For successfully claiming the head of Hanavi Rents, your Polaris bank account has automatically received the bounty reward of 250,000 coin. In addition, on behalf of the Tavera family patriarch, an additional 190,000 coin has been deposited. Oh. My face was neutral. Money was always welcome, but I still wasn't sure how I felt about being paid for this. It seemed that the bounty had also somehow increased in the time I spent hunting him. Oh well. I had used a bit over 100,000 coin for the freed slaves, and I wasn't exactly in a position to reject payment. After that, I looked at everything else. Plex sent me a few messages in regard to our job from Apic Ryan, which was today. We would handle it during sunset, which wasn't long from now. Other than that, I had several messages from Omara, some of them about the results of their questioning, others wondering where I was. The messages from Vetsman and Faden were asking where I was on behalf of Omara. To ease her worries, I gave her a call after texting Vetsman and Faden reassurances. She picked up instantly. John. Hey. Sorry about the delay. I was a bit busy. That's okay. I was just worried. Were the jobs really that time-consuming? Well, something like that. It got a bit dangerous so I couldn't really respond. I decided to refrain from telling her about it for now. No need to spoil her mood with Christmas just around the corner. Still, her voice brought a smile to my face. I decided to meet with her and bring myself a bit more ease. 
I have some more business tonight, but I'd like to see you today. Do you have time? Of course. Just give me the location and I'll be there. Sure thing. With a goodbye we hung up. After I found a suitable place for a short date, I got dressed and sent her the location. We met up a little while later. She came dressed in some beautiful yet casual clothes fit for the chilled weather. Her head tilted though when she approached. What's wrong? Are you okay? Yet. Yeah. I let out a breath, the two of us hugging. Just realizing how lucky I am to be with someone like you. Oh oh. Thank you. I I mean, I feel lucky too. She stammered a bit, making me chuckle. Come on. Grabbing her hand, I pulled her into the nearby cafe. I only had a couple hours, but that was enough to talk about recent events. Particularly, she informed me about what was going to happen in regard to the Cyclops Scout. The testimonies of my squad all came back completely true, which means there was zero doubt that I had actually killed it single-handedly. And since I had broken some kind of record, I was going to be placed within the Magisterium's Hall of Fame. It was a place only the best elites could have their image enshrined. The body of that scout would be put on display, evidence of my kill, and my name would accompany it as the first Authority 4 to ever kill an Authority 7. Whenever something like this happened, there would be a big announcement and an award would be given out, though I didn't know when. I imagined that it would happen after Christmas since everyone was out anyway. Well, at this point I wasn't sure I cared. I had now killed an Authority 7 warlock, so the Cyclops felt a bit underwhelming. And after what I just went through, I simply wasn't in the mood to care. So as she spoke, I simply rested my chin on my hand and stared at her, appreciating her presence, and realizing that I really, really liked this girl. Was it enough to say that I had fallen in love? A small smile rested on my face as I watched her talk. Ah, she was so pretty. Perhaps she noticed too, because at some point she stopped talking and started reddening. She fidgeted in her seat, occasionally glancing at me to check if I was still staring. So I could still tease her. Good. After a few minutes of that I finally laughed and diverted my gaze. We went on to talk for a while until I had to leave. I told her that I was going on a dangerous job, so we ended our date with a long kiss. With that, I made my way to the Founders Market. I looked at Rayla as we trudged through the trenches. Plex took the lead and Libidus tailed him. We made conversation along the way since we hadn't seen each other in a while, killing time as we trekked over to Apocryon's headquarters. Nothing from my aura tipped me off but I knew that would change as soon as we arrived. I was especially curious to see Apocryon again. Back then, that madman was able to twist my mind with illusions. I saw and felt him kill me, yet it was nothing more than one of his tricks. I had thought it was just his magic back then, but now I wasn't so sure. Since I was with a group, even the most foolhardy opportunist could only sulk and glare from alleyways. So we arrived at the headquarters smoothly. And there, I saw Apic Ryan. He sat atop a particularly large APC mod with all kinds of scrap metal and mounted spikes. It fit the psycho vibe this place gave off. And he felt the exact same as last time. Waves of unrestrained power rippled off his body, nearly tangible in their force, carrying an aura of unhinged psychosis. His eyes were particularly stinging. My aura felt like it would be swallowed by his. Dressed in a dirty lab coat, he jumped up as soon as we stepped foot into his territory, entering the plaza in front of the headquarters. Ah, my favorite delivery man. And John. You've made quite the name for yourself since I last saw you. A far cry from that little kid several months ago. And I still vividly remember you tearing my chest open with your bare hands. Ha, a mere trick of the mind. I can see your aura. I've never seen someone progress so far in such a short amount of time, not since I did so myself. Let me see you clearly. I was silent. I had kept Plex in front of me to hinder line of sight between us, but now he was asking to meet head on. And I was curious myself. So I stepped forward, standing next to Plex as I stared him down. That's when I saw it clearly. His aura. It wasn't like mine, all foggy and malleable. His was like a storm of needles, capable of piercing through all. And at the center of that storm was an eye. A massive eye that peered straight into my mind. As soon as I looked into it, I felt my surroundings change. The surrounding people faded away, the ground turned black as spikes jutted from the floor all around me. They pierced my feet, my legs, my chest. Skewered me from every possible angle while tearing my body apart with bladed protrusions. But, 
through the arresting illusions, I was able to get a glimpse. The slightest indication that all of it was fake. The smallest sign that it was all planted into my mind instead. I was able to dissociate from the pain, just slightly, just enough for it to not be overwhelming. He really was a warlock, which made sense since he could concoct potions and medicine. But his aura's ability to tamper with the mind was inconceivable. There wasn't an ounce of mana utilized within any of these illusions. Still, I fought back. My resistance appeared in the form of that foggy cloud that tried to wear away at all the spikes. But it was nowhere near enough. It didn't so much as leave a scratch. The difference between us was incredible. And yet I was able to see the path forward. Suddenly, I raised my hand, in it a 1911. And I fired straight at him, the bullet bearing my aura tearing through the illusion, piercing through several spikes between us. But the bullet shattered before it could reach him, Apocryon's mere thought enough to reduce it to dust. Amazing. He mumbled and pointed a long finger at me. A needle manifested, soaring toward me. Despite being slower than my bullets, it advanced steadily toward my forehead, even my heightened awareness unable to pull me out of the way in time. It would have pierced my head if not for Plex stepping back in front of me. That's enough. Ugh. I collapsed as soon as the illusion fled, buckling as blood poured from my eyes, nose, and mouth. Someone caught me. I was barely able to tell it was Rayla. Without a word, she started mopping up my face. Focus on me. I stared blankly, my mind still recoiling from the sensation of having multiple needles driven through it. What an amazing power. Through the horrible illusions I could see the remarkable skill and profound knowledge behind it. He was capable of killing with his aura. It was clear that I wouldn't be going down that path, but my path wasn't much different. My aura was an extension of my mind, of my psyche. And I would use it as such, wielding my mind, my strongest attribute, as a tool to fight others. Previously I had been worried about subterfuge. I wanted Plex's invisibility because it would keep me safe and allow me to use my guns with complete freedom. But maybe I didn't need invisibility. Maybe I just needed an illusion of it. Knights, my most threatening foes, would be at the mercy of my powerful mind. Anyone else could be killed by my guns with relative ease. Yes, this was it. I lifted my head with this revelation, barely able to see Apic Ryan discussing something with Plex. When he sensed my gaze though, I sent out my aura once more, this time delivering a message to his own. I figured it out. Thank you. Ha ha ha. He suddenly laughed, startling, and silencing Plex. To think I've been used. Amazing. To think you were talented enough to use me for your own gain. Pray, John Cooper, that you are simply envied and not feared. Or be doomed to the path I have walked. Do you understand me? Yes. I nodded as he almost screamed at me. With every second, my mind gradually recuperated and I was eventually able to climb back to my feet. I watched Apic Ryan as he made the exchange with Plex, thinking long and hard about what he said. Be envied, not feared. I could imagine why he said that. I was already dealing with such things from nobles. If they envied me, then they would simply hate my presence, perhaps taking some measures to get rid of me. If they truly feared me, then I was as good as dead. They would stoop to any level to remove the threat, my days would be numbered. Had he gone through something like that? Everyone already feared him, and perhaps the only reason he was able to survive was because he pushed his power to the extremes that he did. I had a feeling that he wasn't always the psycho everyone knew him to be. People were often shaped by their circumstances and environment. Maybe Apic Ryan was another victim. I took his advice to heart, starting to think that I needed to hide certain powers of mine. Apic Ryan threw Plex a box, its contents only to be revealed at the auction. A bag of gold, almost like an afterthought, was thrown over Apocryon's shoulder as he strolled back into his headquarters. Plex caught it, only his hands and a knowing smirk visible before he vanished without a trace. Libidus, Rayla, and I could see the surrounding individuals start to advance on us. The other two started prepping for combat, but I just raised my gun up and fired into the sky. Bang! A piercing explosion cut out the once enthusiastic would-be ambushers. Everyone froze. By now, my guns had left a permanent mark on the residents of the trenches. I looked around, donning my hood. You know who I am. Fuck off. Silence prevailed. Some remained frozen, others backed off or ran. I let the tension pervade for a few more seconds, then walked off. The others walked with me, 
our very surroundings seeming to cringe back from our presence. Just like that, we left the trenches. Libidus chuckled. Just try strolling into the trenches, they said. Easier than I've heard. Shut up. Haha, <laughs> I'll give you some of my cut as thanks for lending us your infamous name, Mr. American. Don't worry about it. Just buy me a drink tomorrow. Sure thing. He patted my shoulder as the pain in my mind shifted from stabbing pains to a hammering headache. At least it was better than earlier. I took out a stoga to help, but much of the damage was aura-based, a smoke could do nothing for mental debilitation. The reason I bled at all was because of a spike in blood pressure, my body reacting negatively to the crap going on mentally. If I had spent any longer within Apocryon's aura, then I probably would have had an aneurysm. For now, I just needed rest, recovery would come naturally. Of course, we had to stop by our place of business first. Plex had already arrived at the warehouse, but evidently wasn't expecting us to return so soon. I put my hand out, making him smirk and throw a bag of coin. Inside was 150,000 coin. Hazard pay. Now get out of here and prepare for the auction tomorrow. Sure. I nodded before stashing the coin. When I turned, I saw Rayla looking at me. She smiled and squeezed my shoulder. Go rest up. I smiled back as she walked past and received her own pay. After wishing goodbye to Libidus as well, I left and headed to the Black Spider Hotel. I also texted Umara, letting her know that I was fine. Of course, she also came over once she heard that I was done. I hung around in the lobby for bit and brought her up when she arrived. Unfortunately, I didn't really have the energy to engage with her. She saw the smeared blood on my face and helped me clean up before both of us went to bed. Thankfully the cigar had at least calmed my mind, allowing me to fall asleep relatively easily for someone who just had some needles driven into his brain. I passed out with tomorrow's auction in mind. And NBSP. End Chapter 78, Executioner That time an American was reincarnated into another world by SP4DE. Chapter 79, Auction Come one. Come all. From all around the kingdom. Every color, every crest, every creed. Gather on this night and celebrate. The time of the year we've all been waiting for. The night of prosperity. Of generosity. Of salvation. Of love. Everyone let your hearts out. And rejoice in the glow of the midnight moon. Vatsi Scala has begun. Cheers rose above even the sound of the fireworks going off behind the announcer, a thousand masked faces doused in multicolor light. The massive black spider plaza almost seemed cramped from all the festive cheer. I let out a few laughs as I watched, Dumara jumping in excitement beside me. Both of us were masked like those around us. Taking a quick glance over at her, I once again appreciated the way her hairstyle highlighted her image, hanging strands accentuated her face, and a voluminous bun topped her head. I caught myself staring, thinking of earlier when I was once again stunned by how beautiful she looked. I almost started thinking myself inadequate. That red dress, full ruby lips, the pale nape of her neck and the sharp but graceful visage she carried in public. Damn if I didn't think I was lucky after catching this one. Or did she catch me? I would say that I was a catch. She didn't even have to go fishing. This is so cool. So much better than that stupid noble party. I'm glad you're not missing out on anything. This is my first time at a Christmas celebration as well. You've never celebrated Christmas. No, I have. I've never celebrated it here though. Luminescent streamers and floating lanterns floated lazily about on faint air currents, buildings, trees and lamp posts occupied by the colorful decorations. Various magic kites shaped like animals also flew through the air, eagles, lions, and fish dancing among more fantastical beasts. There was even a rather realistic scourge kite, no doubt the product of some intrepid mind, satisfyingly misshapen from punches thrown at it. Dozens of servers roamed about with platters full of familiar and exotic drinks, offering refreshments at no cost. This vasty really had to be astronomically wealthy to hold such a massive celebration for hundreds of influential individuals, let alone not charge a dime for it and the auction hadn't even started yet. This was just the pre-game. Spotting some familiar drinks, I grabbed two glasses and handed one to Umara as we walked down the road. There were several bands and orchestras playing at various areas along the sidewalks. Going from one place to another would accompany a change in symphony, most of it excitable, some of it grand. Between those were performers straight out of a circus. Most were warlocks who knew tons of party tricks, 
throwing up explosions of color and creating fake animals to prowl about the crowd. Umara wasn't the only one discovering something new. I had never seen such a festive place before. It was like the last gala was barely even trying compared to this. But this was also a celebration of both Christmas and the New Year. I could understand why they would pull out all the stops for this one in particular. And since there was so much to see and all night to do it, I let myself be pulled around by my girlfriend, experiencing everything the night had in store. That by itself took over an hour. From performer to performer, we watched dozens of stunts and tricks, the wide variety greatly expanding my impressions of magic. And from band to band, Umara pulled me in to dance to each one. Fortunately she was a better dancer than me, so besides some intentional goofiness to tease a reaction out of her, I let her lead me along. Not that I couldn't be a little groovy. Although she received some second-hand embarrassment, I laid out some pretty slick moves on the dance floor guaranteed to catch eyes, for better or worse. It was only after I was dragged off three times that we finally started making our way to the auction. As the time approached, a huge crowd made their way inside. There were several doors to enter for varying levels of prestige. As the time grew near, the crowd near the entrance steadily grew bigger, crowding into several general entrances. Smaller groups and individuals peeled off the mass to enter through more exclusive doors. Since I wasn't interested in waiting and Plex wasn't here to guide me in, I linked arms with Umara and went toward the VIP doors. The bouncer stared me down, seemingly doubtful someone like me would be approaching the VIP entrance separate from a party, but remained professional and asked for identification. I was told this would be enough. I reached into my coat and pulled out my golden cigar case. His brows raised as he stepped aside. Enjoy your night. You too. I smiled and walked in. Umara nudged me with her elbow as I found the Tavera suite. Look at you moving around like a big shot. You're like a noble in the black market. A small one, but I would agree with that. I smirked and found a door, opening it to the sounds of chatter. Once inside, I saw Patriarch Tavera, Plex, and his entourage mingling with almost two dozen others sporting Tavera regalia. John and his lady have arrived. Good to see you. You too, Patriarch. I shook hands with the man. And when the Patriarch greeted Umara, he simply gave her a nod. I had discussed with Umara beforehand on the protocol for these events, and the consensus was that anybody who didn't already know who she was didn't need to know. She already had an alias made up for greetings with strangers. As for those who knew, they would likely be courteous of her identity and do what the Patriarch just did, act like she wasn't someone of any significance. Here, she was just my girlfriend and had zero notoriety to speak of. Perhaps Umara was right. In the black market, the roles were flipped. I was a small-time noble while she was just a commoner. John. Remember me. Captain Ignove. It's been a while. I shook hands with this unexpected friend. Back when I had been called upon to help guard a convoy for Patriarch Tavera, he had been our commanding officer, an authority seven knight who protected us from an equally powerful pugilist. He was now stationed at a branch base in the city of Jofrun, which was also where I first met Duchess Talaria. We smiled at each other. Here on vacation. Of course. Couldn't miss the year's greatest celebration. I know. I didn't expect it to be this amazing. Ah, it's your first. Well congratulations. It doesn't get much better than this. So it's all downhill from here. Haha, <laughs> that's one way to look at it. He chuckled before glancing over, seeing Umara standing to my side. Who's this? I don't recall you having a lady last time I saw you. This is my girlfriend. Alice Vander. Pleased to meet you, Captain Ignove. Likewise. Ignove bowed as Umara curtsied. So, where did you two meet? At the Magisterium. She's my favorite warlock. And he's my favorite summoner. All right, all right. Ignove chuckled and waved as Umara and I pushed our noses toward each other. I'll stop you there before you two get all cute. Anyway, be sure to pay attention to the auction. Not everything is going to cost a million coin, and there's a lot of good stuff being put up. It's by far the largest auction of the year. What you'll see here may never be seen again. M.M., I'll be sure to watch. We shook hands, giving a momentary goodbye. Inside the suite, there was an entire bar with a constant supply of snacks, so Umara and I hung around until Patriarch Tavera called for me. His other guests were just exiting, so we exchanged greetings and sat down near him. John, I wanted to congratulate you. 
For what? For killing Han of you, of course. You haven't forgotten something so recent, have you? Oh, that. I gave him a small smile, noticing Umara's neutral face to the side. She kept a good poker face despite the subject. I wouldn't say it's anything worth congratulating. It's only regretful that he couldn't be killed sooner. He was slippery, cautious. Nobody was capable of doing anything to him. In the short times that he would ever appear, he would always be guarded heavily. And all other times, he was hidden and impossible to bait. Many attempts have been made before and by people with much higher authorities, trust me on that. But in just two days, you were able to do what nobody else had done before. The patriarch leaned forward. John, I gave you that job hoping it would merely catch your interest and that, in time, you might find an opportunity. I had hoped that your specialty might make things easier, but the pessimism in me didn't believe it would take any less than a year. And then one evening, I heard a single explosion. Small, hardly noticeable, but a sound no less infamous than the American who produced it. One shot, heard across the entire market. A man who had mastered his trade over the last five decades had been killed so quickly, so easily it would make the others before you puke. It's nothing short of a miracle, and one not unnoticed. I heard about the slaves you subsequently helped escape. Already the name American is making rounds around the market, but instead of him being the terror of the trenches, he's the father of freedom. Hum. A humored hum escaped my pressed lips. I didn't mind the ring to that name. Something about it made my American blood tingle pleasantly. The patriarch leaned back as he saw me ease up a bit. I responded with a diverted gaze. I'm not yet that amazing. Freeing those who have been kidnapped and trafficked is a given. They should never have been in that situation to begin with. And yet they were there anyway, the victims of those inebriated with power. So do you not at least take pride in doing something nobody else had been able to, or even willing to, before? Maybe. But it's not enough. More people should be tackling this issue. If I were able, just based on the things I saw two days ago, not to mention what really happens behind closed doors. I would be driven to dismantle the Clockwork Association and abolish it entirely. Those who run that mafia are disgusting. Indeed. But you'd have to be on the level of a duke in order to do so yourself. Yes, it's unfortunate that I can't simply put a bullet in each of their heads. But that doesn't mean nothing can be done about the trading. Are you thinking of fighting it? He asked with a curious glint in his eye. But, my response was a shake of the head. No. No? Sounds hypocritical, yes. Yeah, it is. But. I don't believe I'll need to. I thought back, remembering my recent dream. It's simply not my calling. Hmm, I see. Well, I know that you're a courageous young man highly unlikely to shy away from any battle. In this era, such people are dwindling. He suddenly reached over, placing his strong hand on my shoulder and looking me in the eye. You just keep on going. Great things lie ahead so long as you keep that good head on your shoulders. Thank you, Patriarch. Of course. His hand moved off my shoulder, lowering to my wrist where he tapped my aerial with his own. I was surprised as his contact info was transferred. If you ever feel the need to go and hunt some rats, let me know and I'll point you the way. I can't promise that the slave trade will be eradicated, but you'll at least be suitably rewarded. Right. Thanks. Enabling good people should be a given. Now go have fun tonight. There is still darkness in the world, but there's no reason that should stop you from seeing the light. You are especially deserving, considering your work in helping others do the same. Without you, nearly 150 people would be living very dark lives right now. Remember that. I was silent, giving him a small nod before standing with Umara. He smiled at her once before we left. Take care of this one, little miss. Don't let him get in his own head. Don't worry, Patriarch. I'm by his side whether he likes it or not. She smiled and intertwined her fingers with mine, causing him to laugh. After that we left, taking a seat at one of the many tables by the massive window overlooking the auction stage. The main event was about to start. End NBSP. End Chapter 79, Auction. That time an American was reincarnated into another world by SP4DE. Chapter 80. Katana. Are you okay? I'm doing better. I smiled while watching the auction stage. The auctioneer was almost done giving his opening speech, dropping sly hints about the most valuable items to come. 
Since Umara was next to me while Patriarch Tavera gave his encouraging words, she had caught the gist of the situation. Of course, since the topic had been brought up, my mind drifted to darker places and it ended up dampening my mood, despite the Patriarch's reassuring words. I suppose Umara noticed, and so she started to comfort me in her own way. The man you killed was a slave trader. Yet. Sometimes I forget those kinds of people even exist. Most people can't even conceive of the concept. What's the kingdom's history with slave trading? I suddenly asked, wondering if it was anything like what I had known on Earth. Umara gazed off into the distance and thought. Before, it was Magi who enslaved the ordinary. In the early days of the kingdom, there were several major territories that, although united, generally didn't consider themselves a single entity. And the ruling duke of those territories would own quite literally everything underneath him. You could say there were entire kingdoms enslaved to their king. I supposed it was quite like the feudalism of medieval Europe. Wow. And what stopped that? Well, for one, the pressure of the scourge. This was centuries ago, and the kingdom was forced to grow as they and the scourge began to recognize each other as foes and do battle. However, what gave the ordinary people true freedom was the church. The church, hey. My brows raised as she nodded. They led the charge for the abolition of all slavery and slave trading. At first, when the kingdom first united under threat of the scourge, they pushed for their most powerful man, the founding king of Adia, to take the throne. And he didn't like being pressured by the church, which, while a part of the kingdom, was a separate governing entity. So he brought together all the dukes and declared war on the church in an attempt to fight for complete sovereignty. And how did that end? Not very good, because the church's paladins came in and killed him the day after he declared war. I was shocked not thinking the church had the balls to do something like that, let alone the strength. They made it seem like the kingdom never really had any power at all. Umara continued. Anyway, the entire conflict ended in just a few days and the abolition of slavery as a whole was written into law. This included servitude of any kind, because later on when old slavers tried to enslave through debt, it led the entire kingdom into such a bad economic depression that the church once again came in and outlawed things like interest on loans and certain banking practices which had led to the problem in the first place. Interesting. I never really understood the financial side of it, but that was around 170 years ago, and we're more prosperous now than ever before, so it apparently worked. Apparently. I reclined in my chair, thinking about the curious history of this kingdom. It seemed like the church played a major part in its development. They were more of a behemoth than I realized, even though I never heard much about them in my daily life. Still, it was the dominant, perhaps the only real religion that all of humanity followed in this world. It was no wonder that they wielded vast power rivaling the entire kingdom. The more interesting point though was how they didn't actually take the kingdom for themselves. I was sure that they installed their own people into positions of political power, but the king was still separate from the church, at least on paper. Like the father of a bunch of unruly children who didn't know better, they came in and whipped them into shape whenever they got out of hand. From everything I've seen, it's led to vast prosperity across the board, but then again, I didn't have any experience outside of major cities. Nonetheless, the monuments were massive and the roads were clean. Gold flowed like a river and food was plentiful. Sure, this kingdom probably didn't have much of a middle class. There were the rich and the poor, with the poor composing the majority but that was more so due to the lack of skilled labor, or what I would know as some blue and white collar jobs. There was no industrial revolution, so most people still lived outside the city, probably farming. Or they were in the military fighting. There wasn't much helping that. People needed food and water, and a lot of it, so most effort was devoted toward that since there wasn't any machinery to multiply it. Anybody else was either doing manual labor in something like a mine, or they got lucky enough to become a magus and enter the skilled labor fields under magic, comprising an extremely small middle class. It also didn't help that the nobility was the most powerful group of magi, giving them rich control over both the economy and the magic sector. I was able to benefit from the small amount of developed technology there was in the heart of humanity's only kingdom. My experience was by no means representative of the majority. Short of starting an industrial revolution, there was little I could do to help any of that. All these thoughts pulled my mind away from the dark topics of human trafficking. I had never properly learned about any of this world's history and found it rather interesting. Eventually though, the topic shifted to the auction before us. The beginnings of these auctions were always slow, but the items shown were still interesting. 
most of them wore trinkets good for nothing other than their obscurity or rarity. For the first hour, everything was kept under 100,000. Each item appeared on a huge screen behind the auctioneer, making sure that everyone could see the item clearly regardless of distance. The Pelt of an Authority 5 Unique Eagle Beast Hunted near the front lines, this extraordinary piece of leather still maintains its inherent fire enchantments. Bidding starts at 40,000. The Skull of a Colossal Needle Bird These extraordinary creatures have the longest beaks in the world, and to date, this is the longest one ever hunted. At 12 feet long, it'll assuredly be a prized part of any hunter's collection. Bidding starts at 50,000. A mysterious blade from a distant land. Its curved body contains no enchantments and indecipherable text unknown to any historian in the kingdom. It was found on the border of the kingdom and the outlands with a small booklet. Its subpar battle characteristics make it unsuited for fighting, but its curved form is sure to fill a unique hole in any collector's vault. Bidding starts at 50,000. Wait. I suddenly sat up, seeing the blade on display. Those characters across its body, the curved black blade, the wrapped hilt, and the tassel hanging off it. How could I not recognize one of the most popularized weapons on earth, the Japanese katana? My heart pounded in my chest as I raised my voice. How do I bid? You need a card. Attendant. Right here, sir. After the patriarch responded and called, a man came rushing over with said card, handing it to me. I immediately tapped it, sending out a bid. New bid of 100,000. Can I get 110? 110,000 for this refined blade of mysterious origin. 100,000 going once. 100,000 going twice. Clack. Sold. Once the count was up, my face brightened. Nice. What was that? Do you know what that blade is? Umara asked as I settled back down. I could feel her growing curiosity, how she normally got when she found something interesting to pry into. Maybe. My leg bounced as I watched the katana get taken off stage, the next item taking its place. A few minutes later, two people entered the suite, carrying the package. I stood and walked over. Bidding card, please. Here. I handed the card over, and once checked, they handed it back and gave me a box. Thank you for your patronage. M.M. I nodded and took the box, walking back over to my little table and laying it out. Umara sat up, observing it curiously as I popped it open. I could feel all the other curious gazes as well. Though they wouldn't buy it for themselves, that didn't mean they couldn't be interested in something novel. Even Plex walked over, standing over my shoulder. What's that? A sword. No shit. You know what it is. We're about to find out. I spoke while popping the box open seeing the one-sided curved blade. And seeing the characters up close, although I wanted to doubt my eyes, I knew what I was seeing. Japanese characters written along the body in red, contrasting against the pitch black blade. It felt like a metal, but not entirely, making me wonder how it was made. But that was inconsequential. The point was that this was a sword that could only have been made by someone from Earth. I wasn't alone. After staring at the blade for a while, I looked at the tassel and frowned lifting it with my fingers. On the high end of the tassel was a small colored piece resembling the Japanese flag, a white backdrop with a big red spot in the center which outright confirmed my guess. But then, below that, was a little fox girl charm from what I could only assume was an anime. It was so well made that I questioned its purpose. Whoever this was basically strapped a figurine to their sword. Who's the weeb that owned this? Show yourself. I rolled my eyes after a few seconds, setting the sword back down. This was a Japanese katana, no question. Whoever owned it or created it was from Earth. I wasn't the only one, though I started to question the unknown larger purpose for bringing people here from another world. If whoever did this wanted to save this world, then they surely didn't bring enough people. And if not, then why bring us at all? Or was this some freak interdimensional accident and at least two people just happened to get caught up in it? That was unlikely. Regardless, I had a new goal which was to try and find the owner of this weapon. It was said to have been discovered on the border of the kingdom's territory, near somewhere called the Outlands. I didn't know what that was, but even Maxwell once told me that the kingdom was not the last bastion of humanity. There were more out there. We were just cut off from them. Perhaps that's where this person came from. As for what happened to them, I couldn't really assume. I just hoped they weren't dead. 
the sword didn't paint that picture, but I didn't know the circumstances of its discovery. I sighed and looked over, finding a small booklet. When I opened it, I saw nothing but gibberish. It was a combination of Japanese and some other language, perhaps the language of whatever kingdom they had been brought to. However, there wasn't only text. There were also some pictures. After skipping past some of the anime doodles that made my brow twitch, I found some obscure drawings that didn't quite look like any enchantments or magic spells, but close enough to make me think it was some different kind of magic. After a while, I just shut it, contemplating and ignoring Plex's questions. I had many questions of my own, none of which would be answered anytime soon. It wasn't like I could search for a Japanese person on my own, not to mention that they probably weren't within the kingdom anyway. I would have to get to the point where I had enough power to find any nations beyond the kingdom of Dragon Tongue. I needed to explore the Outlands. But that would only happen years from now at the least. So for now, I just needed to sit tight and train. Still, knowing that there were other Earthlings in this world made me question my own presence here. Something was going on and it was bigger than anything I alone could dip my toes in. I was already in over my head in more than a few other areas. I didn't need to keep poking beyond my pay grade any more than I had to. After another long stare, I finally closed the box and threw it in my spatial sack, waving the curious Plex away. Once he was gone, Dumara leaned over. So. It's from my homeland. Oh. I'm not sure if that's a good thing. I'm not either. Its presence here is a miracle, but what it represents is a lot more important. I thought I had been the only one. Turns out I'm not. Well, from the little you've told me, I would assume that it's at least comforting. I didn't respond. I wasn't that concerned about the fact that someone from my home planet was here. I wouldn't know them and while we might share a common origin to bond over, it wouldn't change much about what I would continue to do. I was concerned about what it meant for there to be multiple Earthlings here. I had already been curious about what it meant for cold summoners to be able to summon weapons from other worlds. At the very least, there were three worlds in existence and likely many more. I had seen weapons from Vetsman's mother, guns from Earth, and then this world itself. I had a faint feeling that it was all connected somehow. The ability to summon extra-dimensional weapons, people being swapped between worlds, and most importantly, the Scourge. The magnitude of each factor could change things for better or worse. That's why I wasn't concerned about this unknown kin from Earth. I was concerned about what their, and my own, presence meant. At some point though I stopped thinking about it. This changed nothing but my personal opinion. My goal remained the same. Now though, there was just one new thing added to my ever-expanding to-do list. Find a stick, and whack this weeb over the head with it for putting an anime girl on their sword in another world. And NBSP. End chapter 80, Katana. Thank you. Please give one subscribe if you are happy. Don't forget to follow, I will continuously release new stories.